Welcome, my friends. Welcome to the outer fringes of reality, where fact meets speculation, where paranoia meets illumination, where madness overlaps the fragile membrane of sanity. Welcome. Do not be afraid. Open your eyes and open your minds to that region that lies beyond the realm of the known, that region we call the exozone. I am your host, Dictor Van Doomcock, the future ruler of Earth, of course, and with me is my co-host, an aficionado of all things fringe, the nerdrotic channels, Gary Beekler. Gary, welcome, my friend. How are you today? Despite pulling a rookie move right there, I'm doing just great. How you doing? <laughs> welcome, I everybody. am doing absolutely fine. Uh, this is our relaunch of the Exozone. We've been gone uh, since late last year uh, when Christmas kind of, you know, came and and uh, buried us in an avalanche of snow and, of course, coal, because we've all been very naughty. And, uh, you know, here we are with two, uh, dare I say, celebrities, experts in their fields. And uh, they have been generous and kind enough to uh, visit with us today. And I, I want to go ahead and introduce you uh, to them and them to you in just a moment. But my, my fellow seekers of wisdom and truth, I just want to say that uh, you're in for a treat today, and that's a gross misunderstatement, uh, because today we bring you <laughs> two incredibly knowledgeable and accomplished guests in the field of ufology and paranormal phenomena, and we're honored to bring both of them to you today. Now, please be advised, this episode of the Exozone will be like no other we've presented before. For the first hour to an hour and a half, we will only be interviewing our guests, we may occasionally read any Super Chats addressed specifically to them, but we will handle Super Chats differently just for this particular episode and only for this episode. The rest of our live streams will not be changing in the slightest. After our main interview is concluded, we will then read Super Chats uh, that are addressed to them and give them a chance to speak directly to you, the audience. And, uh, and then once they leave, we'll handle the rest of the Super Chats uh, that are not related to them. Uh, and bear in mind, this is a paranormal uh, broadcast, not a, not a pop culture one. So, you know, Star Wars questions probably would only get answered at the very end. Uh, and please, during the stream, don't be asking why we're not answering your Super Chats. We will get to them before the show is over. We leave no Super Chats behind in the Exozone. Never. And now, seekers of wisdom and truth, I'd like to introduce you to our distinguished guests, each of them experts in their fields. Peter Robbins is an investigative writer specializing in the subject of UFOs. He has more than 35 years experience as a writer, researcher, investigator, lecturer, and author. A regular fixture on radio shows in the U.S. and in the U.K., he has appeared as a guest on and been consultant to numerous television programs and documentaries. Mr. Robbins has spoken on UFOs, Dr. Wilhelm Reich, and related subjects at local, regional, and national and international conferences, as well as for schools, universities, libraries, and organizations. He is an author, uh, co-author of the British bestseller Left at Eastgate, a first-hand account of the Rendlesham Forest UFO incident, which we have discussed on this show before. It's cover up an investigation. He is the author of Deliberate Deception, a case of disinformation in the UFO research community, and Halton Woodbridge, an Air Force colonel's 30 year fight to silence an authentic UFO whistleblower. He has just completed an hour long documentary on the mysterious alleged suicide of Secretary of Defense James Forrestal, who was allegedly one of the founding members after the Roswell incident of the above top secret organization, MJ-12. Our other guest is no less distinguished. Christopher O'Brien has investigated over 1,000 paranormal events reported in the San Luis Valley, located in South Central Colorado and North Central New Mexico. Working with law enforcement officials, ex-military, ranchers, and an extensive network of sky watchers, he documented what may have been the most intense wave of unexplained activity ever seen in a single region of North America. His 10-year investigation resulted in the three books of his Mysterious Valley trilogy, The Mysterious Valley, Enter the Valley, and Secrets of the Mysterious Valley. His meticulous field investigation of UFO reports, unexplained livestock deaths, haunted sites, Native American legends, cryptozoology, secret military activity, and the folklore found in the world's largest alpine valley has produced 
one of the largest databases of unusual occurrences gathered from a single geographic region. He is currently working with a team of specialists installing a high-tech video surveillance and hard data monitoring system in and around the San Luis Valley. His latest book, Stalking the Herd, which is available on Amazon, by the way, and we're putting that link up uh, later, is being called the most important book ever written, examining our relationship with cattle and how this is manifested into the modern cattle mutilation mystery. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having us. You guys are very welcome. I am absolutely thrilled to be here with you both. And I just want to go ahead and, and start out uh, throwing out a question to both of you, if I could. Um, how did you originally become interested in the subjects of UFOs and cattle mutilations, crypto creatures, and the paranormal? Uh, Peter, why don't you go first? Sure. But before doing it, two things. Number one, I've never been comfortable being called an expert. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> it's literally oxymoronic. Yeah. Uh, you're an expert <laughs> in the unknown. Very good. Um, <laughs> I, I've studied the subject for over 40 years, uh, been very involved in research investigation, obviously. But um, the way I see it, um, I know how little I know about the subject at this point. I know more than most people, but um, just well, to absolutely. Kind of I think level the that, playing field. Well, we, we are running up against uh, the limits of human knowledge. So, yes, to an extent, I mean, we can say that no human is an expert on any large subject. Now, I'm yeah. an expert on original season of Star Trek, but that's fairly <laughs> fairly finite. You know, I can <laughs> I can grasp that, and I have it on DVD, and I've seen it. You know, each episode like fifty. It's a good thing to be an expert in that first season. Um, the other thing is. Um, Yes, you are absolutely accurate in quoting the uh, two books that I wrote and the other book that I collaborated on, but obviously um, not aware that about three years ago, uh, my co-author on the first book left at East Gate about the uh, well-known Rendlesham Forest UFO incident in the UK in 1980. His account began to unravel and mm -hmm. ultimately he was unmasked as a liar, uh, a fabricator, uh, somebody who filled our book with exaggerations, untruths, and I had to uh, spend several years apologizing to our readers, also to ask our publisher with very mixed feelings to do their own investigation into what I had uh, had to admit after a lot of investigation and reinvestigation. That book went out of print more than a year ago and it will never come back. The same is true for the two books I published independently, also greatly supporting his account, they were peppered with untruths. And so I had to take those. I was obligated to my own level of uh, ethics to remove both of those books from print. So I am here as a best-selling author in the UK, certainly, uh, with no books in print. Just wanted to be clear on that. Well, but that speaks, sir, to your integrity and yeah. uh, and and the fact that you went ahead and 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 broached broach that subject right up front. Uh, I I am not a gotcha kind of journalist. I was not going to say anything, but you have, sir, and uh, more respect to you. Yes, indeed. Uh, so what what uh, gentlemen? What what was it? What passion drove you to investigate? Uh, the things that you investigate. Let, let's uh, let's go ahead and give Christopher a chance. Absolutely, to yeah. Um, well, first, I want to echo what Peter said. Uh, there really are no experts uh, in these subjects. There's only uh, individuals that maybe have more uh, experience under their belts, a little bit more time thinking about yeah. these subjects. And 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 also, I I think if if I think the quality of questions that um, that we ask. Uh, maybe a little um, elevated above the average person because we know more. But then you have the <laughs> caveat, the more you know, the more you <laughs> know you don't know. And so you become more and more confused. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I often say if my if 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 my level of expertise is relative to my level of confusion, I'm really confused. So I really must be an expert. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, we went, but I think it. I think it's safe to say that there are not many people uh, who know more 
than you do about these subjects. So on a relative scale, at yeah. least you can acknowledge that that you are are, are greatly knowledgeable on the topic. I, I, I am. I've, I've read uh, probably a thousand books. Uh, I have a huge extensive library. Um, when it comes to the cattle, cattle death phenomenon, um, there's maybe one or two people that know as much as I do. Uh, probably on the planet, so uh, that I know of. Um, yeah. So in that particular in that particular subject, uh, I, I do feel that um, I, I was really the only one that was positioned uh, properly to actually write the um, you know the definitive book on the subject, and uh, I'm very proud of it. It took 22 years of research and 18 solid months of writing. I, I got hemorrhoids from sitting in, at my desk. <laughs> we're, on, we're, we're on the way, aren't we, Gary? I think we're on yeah. the way. Right uh, behind you. I mean, my, my butt hurt, li literally. Um, well, well, you may have been abducted, <laughs> sir. I hate to tell you that. No, no, we'll get to that no, later. No, no, no. I, I went through two office chairs. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I really have, I must say, before we go on, uh, when I heard about, uh, you know, the whole Larry Warren uh, situation and uh, uh, Peter having uh, incredible integrity to, to, to step forward and say, hey, um, I got punked and I'm really sorry, but, but this, is, this is what happened. And I take responsibility for my role in this. Uh, I have never seen anybody in the field. Uh, stand up and, uh, and and take responsibility for their work, even even in this uh, really embarrassing scenario. And and I, I tell you, uh, I, it's just it just goes to show, I, you know, the type of guy that Peter is, and the amount of respect. I don't know of anybody in the field that has the level of respect that Peter Robbins does. And, and that includes me too. He is uh, a, a real stand up guy. And, and Peter, my hat's off to you, really. Chris, uh, I can't tell you how much that courage. means to me. Thank you very much. It took so much courage to do what you did. And anybody that knows anything about this field uh, is absolutely, um, you know, your biggest fan because of what it took to do that. And my, my hat's off to you. Yep. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Gary, why don't you go ahead and chime in, sir? I know you're bursting with questions. I am bursting with questions. I have, uh, you know, uh, on that subject a little bit, I've been dying to ask this one uh, because I am just, you know, I'm a fan. I'm a novice. I go to contact in the desert. I don't believe everything I hear. One at a time, both of you, we could start with Peter. What uh, what's ba What is your basic opinion i guess on uh the state of ufology i know christopher <laughs> i've listened i know how much you don't like that term so i got you on that one uh whatever term you want to use the current state of it what's your feeling on it we'll start with peter it's mixed um when i became involved many years ago uh it was still the 1970s everything was analog I, um, I should say to your first question, how did Chris and I get involved uh, in our passions for our various disciplines? Um, I grew up in a, a very different America in the early 1960s. I had a very uh, overall happy and very innocent childhood, about as sophisticated as Leave it to Beaver. Uh, by the time I was 14 years old, my main passions in life besides that whole thing about girls and wanting to get very close to one. I was <laughs> the shortest kid in my class. I wore glasses, I was nerdy. I was severely dyslexic. I really wasn't able to master reading until I was about eight or so and then uh, marched my way through half the library of the world. Um, my big passions in life were nature. I was a very proud Boy Scout. I loved camping out. Um, uh, I was a movie fanatic from the time I was a very little kid and went to see so many wonderful old films for, you know, one penny each at the local theater with two cents for popcorn, et cetera. Um, I collected rocks and stamps and bugs, and I had no interest in UFOs other than the wonderful ones I saw in black and white and B-movies on Saturday afternoons with my nerdy little pack of friends. Um, the only major case that had bled its way into American popular culture to a degree by the early 60s, well, 1965, when 
the Betty and Barney Hill case, uh, their abduction happened in 61, but it took four years to make its way into the public. I just had other interests. And then um, I was born in New York City, lived there most of my life, uh, grew up in a very lovely little village about 30 miles east of Manhattan. And one late morning, probably in June, late spring, early summer, uh, my sister Helen and I were goofing around on the front lawn on a beautiful day, as kids will. And it was just, if you grew up in a small town or a village, you know what I'm talking about. There can come a little period of time where there's nobody around. The ice cream truck doesn't go by. There's no traffic. There's no other kids around. It's just you and yourself or your playmate or whatever. And goofing around on the front lawn, I caught something out of my right peripheral vision, looked up in time to see five silvery white disc shaped objects, um, elliptical, like taking a dinner plate at a uh, hand's distance and tipping it in a very precise V formation. And I, um, I have relived this three times in hypnotic regression to confirm that this was all that basically happened to me, unlike my sister who did have an abduction experience associated with this event. Um, and I either said, look, or Helen. And for the next period of time, and it was a long time in kid terms, probably several minutes, which is forever. They literally just hung in the sky over the neighbor's house. I have conducted hundreds of interviews in my life like Chris, and I have uh, had similar, very similar responses from people who have been in similar situations. I call it the checklist response. My rational mind ran through everything that these were not. Airplanes, kites, blimps, balloons, helicopters, flotsam and jetsam, a strange shaped series of clouds. And at a certain point, I literally hit the wall inside myself. I know from hypnotic regressions, which I uh, apparently uh, was a very good subject. All three of my uh, practitioners, including Bud Hopkins, had said I went into alpha very deeply. I wasn't seeing this from a distance. I was reliving it. I could smell the lawn and, you know, uh, I was 14 again. And in re-listening to the recording, very poignant, I was using words and phrases I had, you know, a kid uses, an adult doesn't. And in that last series of moments before having kind of the bottom fall out for me and experiencing, at least briefly, the most profound loneliness I had ever felt, I, I said to myself, basically, quote unquote, yeah, secret government test craft. It must be some kind of <laughs> secret government <laughs> test craft. But yeah. we're looking at these damn things. They're silvery white. They're close enough that both Helen and I can see around the edges of each slightly off color dots moving toward the yellowish. Uh, they weren't shiny like stainless steel, more like brushed aluminum, but they only read the same way that windows would on a commercial aircraft at an appreciable difference. And I mean, it was like they were imprinted on the sky. They were stock still. Um, hmm. At a certain point, I was overwhelmed. And so much so that I went to run into the house to tell our mother who was busy making us lunch at the time or about to. And I got a few seconds away heading toward the front door. And then to compress the story a little bit, I either passed out or was knocked out. I had never passed out in my life. Um, and I felt like I was moving through molasses. Um, it was so different than anything I'd ever experienced. And this may not make, this won't make sense to anybody not familiar with the literature, but it's it's actually one of the hallmarks of this kind of experience that I was so transfixed by what I was feeling and what was happening to me, I literally forgot about what was going on in the sky over the house. And my last three conscious memories, as I was going down in what I felt was slow motion, but at real speed in real life, was number one, how pretty my mom's hydrangea bushes looked that day. She's a wonderful gardener. The next was as I'm coming down, I'm coming into the grass toward the side, the walkway. And there are my old friends, the ants building their little cities and you know, the crack in the sidewalk. I acknowledged that and thought about that for a moment. And then my last thought before everything 
kind of went blue for a split second, then went black, was what a lovely day this is. I swear to God. I woke up at some time later. My sister was not there. They were not there. I shook myself off, went into the house. But before I went in to tell my mom, I, uh, on intuition, I walked up the stairs. Helen and my other sister shared a room, and it was right at the top of the stairs. And there she was, looking out at the backyard with her back to me. And I thought, private moment, went around. There's my mom in the kitchen in right profile. I think she was making grilled cheese sandwiches for us. I remember the exact words I said to her. It was, quote, unquote, Mom, Helen and I just saw some things in the sky over the Parker's house that looked like flying saucers from the movies. Now, many years later, when we sat down with our folks and basically broke the news to them and uh, moved forward from there, my mom didn't remember this, but I have done many interviews with people who were parents and whose own anxiety caused them in a moment like that to say something in response to their child. Oh, honey, it just looked like that, or you were imagining it, or it seemed that way, or saying, no, it couldn't be, or whatever, my mom, her intuition was extraordinary. She just looked at me very seriously for a number of seconds. And I remember thinking, this is the way grown-ups look at each other. And then without feeling the necessity to say anything, went back to doing what she was doing with a serious look on her face. Um, later that afternoon, my sister asked me if I wanted to talk about this. And I said to her, no. And we didn't. It seems hard to believe unless you have uh, penetrated a repressed memory. I don't know if the phrase repressed memory syndrome even existed back then. But in the next couple of weeks, I managed to completely talk myself out of it and then forget it. And only one thing ever shook it loose. Uh, and that was in the height of the 60s uh, on my very first LSD trip where it came up. And then I convinced myself the next day or so, even though I had done some watercolors, which I later destroyed, says something about something, it that memory returned with a vengeance in the course of several minutes in the mid 70s, um, as I was an aspiring young painter following the dream that I had always had from childhood the loft in Chinatown in New York and a lovely girlfriend and teaching at my alma mater, the School of Visual Arts, it came crashing in uh, with a ferocity I'd never experienced. I actually kind of broke down around it. I'm not gonna take the time to tell you why I think it happened then, but I understand there were certain forces at play and I guess I'd mostly I was ready to deal with it. People use the phrase, my life changed overnight. Mine changed in about a minute. After I calmed down, tried to think about what to do next, I couldn't deny it. it. It was, how could I have forgotten it? I must be crazy. And I thought, ah, you had a witness. My sister Helen, an aspiring poet at the time, living on the Lower East Side, about a mile north of me, I called her up, good time to talk. I had enough foresight to at least tell her, I've remembered something from childhood that happened to us, but I'm afraid, and I need to know what you remember, but I'm afraid if I tell you what I remember, you'll say yes or no, and I'll never really know. So let me set the scene. And I started to talk about the weather, the time of year, the time of day, where we were standing in relationship to each other on the front lawn. She cut me off mid-sentence and said, stop, I know what you're talking about. And very quickly, um, remember, told me the same memories I had, except she wasn't sure whether or not it was five or six, which we settled the next day, most definitely, because right after we got off the phone, in a fury of obsession, which lasted for years. This was not something, you know, you can be existential and said you chose to do it and you didn't realize it or what have you. I didn't choose to do this. It wrecked the career I had dreamt of having quite simply. And I resented it for years and I'm still not happy about it in a way. But here I am, um, all these years later, still doing it. Anyway, that afternoon, I did my first painting relative to UFOs and it was very offline to anything I'd ever done in my life. And I, painted in the extra one. And when I showed it to Helen the next day, I covered that with my hand. When she first looked at it, took it away, and she said, you're right, it was five. Anyway, in the phone call, after we were done, she said, but there's more. And <clears throat> told me what was to be insane, impossible, and unlike anything I'd ever heard. Now, not only 
what I've heard, but heard word for word from probably several hundred people over the decades. Flash memories of being on board a craft, flying through the air, being on the table, etc. And my, my life, my career jumped the tracks and that's what I started doing. I continued to paint and teach painting and showing my work, but the heart had gone out of it. And after a number of years, I basically just set my artwork aside and became a full-time writer and investigator. My God, Ooh. this is an embarrassment yeah. of riches. Uh, I, I mean, we, that we, we, we could <laughs> wow. have done a whole show simply <laughs> on that. I am, uh, wow, wow. Uh, okay, I, I would turn to Christopher because that, that is mind-blowing. I mean, Thank you, Peter. Thank, uh, thank you, you Peter. That, that sure. is an incredible story it's it's nothing compared to many stories that i've documented over the decades as chris knows that's entry level strangeness on a certain yeah. level well <laughs> yes. that that is but but it it's it, it speaks from the it, heart it certainly I mean, was it, not for me <laughs> exactly it, it it speaks from the heart and 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 we can all feel your sincerity i mean it's one thing to read these things in a book it's another thing to see a, a creditable man who uh, already like confessed to certain uh, problems with, with some of his publications uh, telling us this stuff I, I I believe I mean and and I I find it incredibly credible and uh, to include Christopher I mean we could spend hours on this but I want to bring yeah, Christopher and I, in. I would love for you to go into that question with Chris and then for us to address the question that you <laughs> asked after <laughs> exactly that's the thing uh, forget my question to hell with it it's all right well, listen yeah I, I, I have <laughs> you, you guys similar. I can go, I'm going to go where you guys go, but here's the thing, Christopher. Can can you share? Can you share with us uh, a a UFO sighting or a haunted site sighting? Anything uh, that I I impacted you in a in a memorable way? Um, yeah, uh, I was close enough to touch him, and uh, they follow me around my neighborhood at three in the morning when I was. That's something else again. About a, a month uh, short of seven years old, and. Um, there were other kids in the neighboring towns. I found out years later, reading a John Keel book, uh, Operation Trojan Horse, that yeah. uh, the town to the uh, east of me and the town to the west, uh, to the east and the town to the north of me had little kids that used the exact same description that I did. Um, I called them stick men. Uh, they were impossibly skinny. They were carrying uh, these two foot. They were about my, my size. Uh, so probably a little under, right around four feet, maybe a little bit smaller. Um, they were carrying these uh, glittering rock. Um, if you can see it in the camera. Um, they were carrying these about two foot, 18 inch, two foot. Uh, they look like, I, I called them spears, but they were, these glittering light was in the, in this like rod and they were holding them out front and they all moved like cattails. Uh, when they when they moved, they didn't uh, communicate with me. I never saw a ship. Um, they were kind of a dirty gray, uh, dirty whitish sort of gray color. Um, I've blocked out what their eyes look like. Um, they had large heads. Um, I, I didn't really get a good look at them because it was very very dark in my uh, in my basement uh, where where my, uh, where my bedroom was. I was below ground level. We lived in a split level house, and um, I tried to go around upstairs and go around the backyard and they they headed me off at the pass and uh, uh i ended up uh, going down the driveway through the big uh, laurel hedge to go bang on my neighbor's door to, so i could go inside and have and have a witness to this um uh, obviously that was important i didn't you know i didn't want people to think i was crazy i was a pretty <laughs> bright bright little kid um and nobody answered the door it's three in the morning and so I went and I was going to go to the Barkers, the next neighbors over, and they had a huge lawn. And then right at the edge of the lawn, they had a, like a farm light, you know, like a bit like a street light. And so I stood out in the middle of the lawn and I, I wanted to get a good look at them, uh, get some light on them. And this is the part that terrified me. Uh, uh, they came, I could see them approaching the light. I really couldn't get a, a, a real good clear view of them. The only light that really showed me what they looked like were the, the the glow from these rods that they were carrying. There seemed to be three of them in the front, and I think one taller one that was, seemed to be hide, hiding in the back. There, there may have been a fourth one, but they came they came to the <laughs> to the to the light shining on the ground. It was a pretty you know pretty defined light 
on the ground from the uh, street light. And um, they, um, they turned sideways and came through the light. Um, it's, it's like they had no depth. It's like they were two dimensional. Um, huh. And they were just thin little lines that I could see coming through. And I'll tell you, when I saw that, I mean, I was, I, I, I ran around to the Barker's front door, banged on their front door. I remember the light coming on. That's the last thing I remember until my sister says 20 minutes. Um, I think it was longer. Um, the Barkers saw me out their window, and when they opened the door, I was gone. And uh, they wondered, you know, what, what the heck I was doing at their at their front door at 3 in the morning. So they called my house, and my sister uh, answered the phone. And they said, you know, he was here a second ago. Come, come see if you can find him. There's something going on. So she came out in her, you know, her robe and kind of a flimsy robe that she had. And, and the next thing I remember is, her running down the, the driveway of the Davises who lived across the street and over two, two houses, three houses. Uh, I was out on their deck somehow. I don't remember getting there. I don't remember going there, how I got there. I don't remember any sort of interval of time. And the next thing I knew, she, I, I thought she was an angel because her diaphanous kind of robe was mm. flowing like an angel. <laughs> and, um, and she saved me. She found me and saved me. And she'd been looking for me for a while. And, uh, of course, I wouldn't go back uh, into my uh, my bedroom. I yeah. was terrified. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so she said, well, you can sleep with me. She was 18. was just getting ready to go off to college. And um, to give you a, a sense of how uh, traumatic the experience was, um, she told me this years later that uh, that I had tried to nurse her. <laughs> When I was in the bed with her, that's how traumatized I was. I, I went into wow. a, like a primitive sort of fetal, you know, she said I was all curled up and, and really freaked out. And, and um, this was a, a pretty big deal in my, my family. Uh, they knew that something had happened to me when I had gone out the back door to run around the house to my folks room. I, I didn't, I, I forgot that my dad had put the screen door on and I opened the door and boom, ran right into the screen door. And so I knew I wasn't having a, like a nightmare or I wasn't sleepwalking or something like that. In fact, I did have a, a slight bruise on my forehead. Um, and, and so my little brother who was, <laughs> who was six, uh, five going on six, he believed me. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, the rest of the family said, nah, you're sleepwalking, and you, you're having a nightmare. And I've never had a dream like that since I've never slept sure. walked. Um, you ask what, how, why I got involved in this. I have been absolutely totally balls to the wall. Um, since then for many, many years, I was in the closet. I did not come out. I didn't want, you know, except close friends, uh, to know, I was involved uh, in researching these subjects. I grabbed every book I could find, um, Incident at Exeter, um, Interrupted Journey. Yeah. Um, I could just go down the list, Anatomy of a Phenomena. All these books that came out in the early to mid-60s, I, I, I read as soon as they came out and I could get a hold of them. Um, I, I would beg, borrow, and steal. And I started my library, all the Adamski stuff, George Williamson, Daniel Fry. I knew about all these guys when I was a little kid. And it wasn't until I moved to the San Luis Valley uh, and I started seeing stuff that, you know, I realized, hey, you know, this is, uh, this, this is something uh, that's still going on. Um, when I moved to the Valley in 89, I, I gave a New Year's Eve party and, and everybody was talking about these this UFO sighting that everybody in the town evidently had had. I, I was gigging with my band that weekend. I wasn't around. Uh, but everywhere I went in this New Year's Eve party, or New Year's Eve 92, um, everybody was talking about this. So uh, then somebody chimed in. Oh, that was the same night they had a cattle mutilation in the next county over. And I was like, oh, oh. boy. Oh, boy. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it, I, I, yeah, I kissed the tar baby that night, and it still stuck to my face. You know. Wow. Um, so I, I became literally a full time investigator, uh, 25, uh, wow. twenty five, twenty seven years ago, whatever. Uh, and and I've, you know, I've. The only reason why I really have have gotten involved in these subjects publicly is because I I uh, found that I was uh, positioned 
uh, to be the only person really yeah. that uh, could write these particular books that I've written because yeah. nobody else uh, was willing to, to to put themselves out there and uh, and do the work. I mean, I put 300,000 miles in my truck in six years. Um, so, you know, I, I really did, uh, as Peter knows, I, I, I worked my tail off. You bet. And, uh, you know, I was able to um, um, get for my first book, 150 people to go on the record, uh, sign release forms. I was allowed to use their names, including a dozen uh, dozen law enforcement officials. I'm very proud of, of the work that I've done. I've been absolutely meticulous uh, as much as I can, as humanly possible, to try to get accurate information out. Um, Linda Howe taught me how to interview people. Good. Tom Tom Adams uh, and uh, David Perkins taught me how to research. David Perkins taught me how to think correctly, and Valet and Keel taught me how to keep an open mind and and uh, and not buy into the knee jerk, uh, you know, aliens coming from another planet, uh, ETH extraterrestrial hypothesis scenario. I am not a believer in that. Obviously, there's there's probably billions of of uh, life uh, civilizations or whatever out there in the galaxies, but uh, I don't think we're important enough for anything to come here. Um, <laughs> and I think we're dealing with something that's probably more terrestrial than we are. And uh, I think that, it, to be honest, I think we're aliens, and that they belong here more than we do. So. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not contrarian you know, when it comes to that. There's not one shred of evidence, uh, unequivocal uh, scientific evidence, uh, to suggest that we're being visited by something outside of our closed system. And um, I, I'm the true believers don't like me and the skeptics don't like me because I'm open minded enough to to entertain all possibilities. So. Well, so I have, tell you, we, we've got yeah, our, no well, friends at all then. <laughs> yeah, I'm right in the middle. I get it from both sides. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I tell you, you've got some fans here. Uh, Casey Osowski uh, with a super chat says, thank you all so much for having the guts to talk about the things others won't. Yeah. So glad uh, we're doing this stream again. I, absolutely. You guys are so forthcoming and so knowledgeable. Yeah. And I, I am so grateful to hear your perspective on these things. Yeah. Um, Peter, I mean, since since Christopher brought it up, uh, what are your feelings? I mean, do you also reject the extraterrestrial hypothesis or are you open-minded about it? Well, when I uh, launched into what I'll laughingly call my career in ufology <laughs> in the mid-70s and started to read some of the same books Chris was, uh, and, you know, it was a great time to begin to build a library on the subject. Uh, now, um, you know, books uh, become more valuable, as especially for bibliophiles um, and book collectors. But for me, uh, I, I read Jacques Vallée, but I was an absolute subscriber to the dominant theory, which was, yes, other planets, other points in the universe, etc. I still believe that. However, uh, I know the I know as well as I can know that that is one component of the other intelligences that we human beings have been interfacing with probably since time immemorial and who probably do have a, a longer stake here than we do. Um, we're limited by our imaginations in a sense because it's such a wide open field and because what constitutes proof to one individual, if you take it down to the baseline, is more often a, a longing, uh, the iconic X-Files poster, I want to believe. We all want to believe something around this. We also want to disbelieve things around this, and we're very selective. We will find um, validations in other people, in other writers, in groups of people, and then subscribe to that theory. That makes it functionally identical to religion. It's a belief based on faith in the belief based on life. So yeah. for me, we're dealing with a myriad of other intelligences. I've never felt really comfortable using the word aliens. And when I actually first started to research that digitally, going back into the New York Times newspaper more, going back to the 40s, uh, in the latter part of it, that word brought up a great deal of people entering the country illegally. Uh, I should say also in 1947, the word extraterrestrial didn't exist in the English language, no. which threw me for a time until I stumbled on articles that mentioned that, but it was two words, extraterrestrial, just a footnote here. 
<laughs> that's a good point. That's Gary, I, yes, I, right. I, I sense you're burning uh, in your chair. Uh, please. Uh, <laughs> ask, ask that a wasn't question. a question. That was my food from earlier. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. The flames okay. and the smoke are not showing yet. So, yes. I, uh, I, I'm with you guys on that one. I, I went through this journey where it was just, it's space aliens. That's what it is. And I have over the last uh, five or six years have really started to move towards uh, being open-minded to it being something else, extra dimensional. I don't know. Or as Christopher said, uh, somebody who was terrestrial, something that was terrestrial long before us, open-minded to all that stuff. Um, but what you were just saying, and I, and I asked the question earlier, but I, you guys had to finish up the first question. So I understand. So again, you, uh, you quote unquote ufology, uh, I, the study of the paranormal, all of it. I love it all. I'm open to any ideas, but what I'm not enjoying personally right now, uh, in ufology is this division. I see there's lots of infighting and I think it has a lot to do with TV shows and it's, it's certainly changed since the days, uh, coast to coast and art bell and again i am just a fan basically i am just a fanboy who, who enjoys listening to you guys and loves this topic uh but i love the search for knowledge and moving things forward and i think yes. we it feels stuck right now do you agree with that or am i yeah. wrong yeah yes yeah. I, i'd say that's a very astute observation um back in the day uh i think i went i gave my first ufo talk in 1977 um, at my alma mater, they was always looking for interesting speakers. I was on the faculty at that point uh, as a painting instructor at the School of Visual Arts in their Department of Continuing Education. And another painter who had become a friend the year before, who also had a profound interest in the subject, uh, I mentioned to him that I was going to give a talk there, and did he want to? And he said, sure. And so on the stage of the School of the Visual, uh, Visual Arts in New York on East 23rd Street, Bud Hopkins and I gave our first talks together. Uh, it was the beginning of a 35-year friendship where I worked for Bud as his assistant for many of those years. We miss him terribly, um, but um, we do great mentor as well. Anyway, um, the first conference I spoke at, I think, was in 1981. And literally every guy there, every guy, well, it was every guy. There were no women, I remember, um, was a middle-aged white guy who, you know, had kind of bro creamed hair, Buddy Holly glasses, a wardrobe that should have been taken off and burned on the spot, <laughs> giant lapels, unconscious dressers. I'm a guy with style. Uh, and a giant hunkin' flying saucer lapel pin. And I thought, <laughs> oh, if I proceed in this work, this will not be my model, which should be my model. Right. And more often than not, I try to affect the look of an investment banker. Give them as small a target to shoot at. If I do it well, they can say, well, well, he's short. And you know about short people. They got a thing. They got an attitude. Um, it was dominated by that. And it was all analog, of course. Um, you did everything in the very old fashioned radio tube manner. Uh, then a little thing called the internet sprung on us and it, boy, is it a double-edged sword. Um, the documentary on Forestall I just completed, um, some people will watch it and think, wow, cool. Must've gone online, gotten all that cool stuff. No, nothing came from online. It was decades of research and 35 separate print sources all documented that I drew from. Um, I think as UFO and paranormal researchers, especially in this day and age of instant international electronic communication, have become personalities. Uh, we have what you always have in a personality-driven field. Fans, people that don't like you, um, the bugaboo of you're in it for the money, one of the funniest lines <laughs> ever said about <laughs> ufology, um, as somebody who has aspired <laughs> to actually try to support myself, at least in part with this work, um, I, I find it hysterical. I, I continue to subsist uh, below the, the national poverty line. I, my income is very limited. I'm not complaining. I live very well, and I, I'm a very blessed person in terms of what I have, what I was given, you know, to start with just being born bluntly white middle class in the United States. That goes a long way to... Uh, 
put you in a better position than 90 plus percent of the people on earth. And I, I don't lose sight of that. But it's more and more now, uh, there are products, uh, there are competing products, there is the sideshow, the soap opera, the infighting about what one well-known researcher might be saying at another one, uh, the desire to take somebody down, what I would call the Lee Harvey Oswald syndrome. If you want to become famous in American culture quickly, shoot somebody who's famous, allegorically or actually, and then you're a player. You know, attack somebody who's yeah. known and do it in a colorful enough way, and your name is right there associated with them. Um, at this point in my life, my work, I'm in the middle of a bit of an experiment. I'm a post-war kid who grew up with my nose pressed to the television. I love films. I grew up as TV grew up. Uh, I'm a political junkie. Put me in front of a TV set. Oh, at a, a completely non-happening time like this historically. And I'm, I'm going to just die and become a skeleton watching all of the pundits argue with each other. This summer, I decided to see if I would still live if I had my cable television shut off. And here I am, still doing it, reading more and spending more time writing, um, watching films uh, when I want to get online, occasionally looking at a set at somebody's house. So, for example, right now, you want to ask me a question about any of the cool new shows that deal with UFOs. I have no idea. I, I listen to other people. I'm got plenty to keep me busy in the meantime, and I don't know if this will last for the rest of my life, but I think we have a real problem that nothing short of mass landings where everybody kind of becomes a ufologist and yeah. people like me sort of lose their job or get snapped up by, you know, uh, the dream for some people is a major network or actually get a job being a mouthpiece for the government or something. How cool to get a regular check doing this stuff. Mm -hmm. Who cares if you made a deal with the devil? You got a paycheck. Um, I consider myself an independent in this work. I have a, a rich life outside of this. And if somebody said, you know, you can't ever deal with UFOs again or we'll kill you, I, um, I would probably go back into um, theater management or return to my career in the arts um, and life would go on. <laughs> that's a that's a great answer. A good question, yeah. Gary. Good question. I I, I know I know what you wanted to ask before. Uh, I, I want to get to give Christopher a chance to uh, to also address the same point about the kind of the state of modern ufology, yeah. and then perhaps both of you could discuss a little bit about the uh, disclosure movement, the current state of it, uh, the uh, you know Nimitz tic tac uh, footage, and and so on. Christopher, sure, please, along. yeah, no, I'll uh, condense all those into one answer. Um, wow, I'm impressed. Yes, I, I I think the um, the advent of the instant of the internet, as Peter pointed out, is a double edged sword. I think that uh, too many people out there with an interest in these subjects, and every year we're finding more and more people getting drawn to the subjects, yes. uh, basically because of the media coverage. It's, it's, it's becoming more robust. Um, uh, there's more sites on the Internet. But unfortunately, about 90 to 95 percent <laughs> of what's on the Internet and almost as much that's on network television yeah. is total crap. Um, it's not accurate. It's totally uh, done for either monetary uh, purposes and selling soap and advertising, or it's done uh, as mis and disinformation, or it's done just to get as clickbait and uh, a way to to generate uh, traffic on on uh, internet sites. Uh, Scott Brown and I have been uh, uh, distributing a list of of questionable uh, UFO sites that numbers well over a hundred uh, secure team 10, uh, the f f uh, you know, and what first phase of moon. I mean, there's so many of these sites that have about 98% crap. And then unfortunately there's 2% of real stuff that gets lumped in with all the crap. Uh, it's very, very unfortunate that, um, that that we're we're going down a road uh, with this whole concept of fake news, and and we're we're you know in these deep fakes now that are going to be able to be uh, perpetrated on the public. 
um, we're not going to know where reality ends and, and fiction begins. We're, we're almost to that point now if, if we could actually be there. Um, and I think that this, this whole, uh, you, you're, you're seeing the effect of this uh, being mirrored in, in the whole idea of disclosure. Um, uh, I think these, these uh, objects and I think these, these intelligences are being couched as extraterrestrials in order for us to be okay with um, experiencing them and realizing they're there. I think their true form and their true uh, presence would be so terrifying and so beyond our, our scope of, of understanding that um, it should, doesn't make sense for them to appear as, as, they, as they truly are because we couldn't handle it. So I think maybe we're seeing a dumbed down process, a, a kind of let's show them what they expect to see uh, type scenario. And um, I, I, unfortunately, um, you know, Peter said he, he thought of at, one, at one point about having a, a career and paying his bills with UFO work. Anybody out there who's a career ufologist, uh, now that Stanton's gone, I can say this with all confidence. Anyone out there who pays their bills with UFO work is suspect. Uh, they have to come up with either a new theory, a new case, some new, uh, you know, attention getting uh, uh, scenario about every six, eight months so that they can stay in the public's mind so that they can continue to sell books, be hired to come and speak at, 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 uh, at events. Um, there's a lot of investigators that uh, uh, have a very close, cozy relationship with the media. They, they, they try to cultivate a cult of personality around themselves. Uh, I've never seen Peter do that. I, I have never done that. I've never made a single call to the media to promote myself. I think that your work should be able to speak for itself and that you don't need to help it. You know, the, the, the Copenhagen interpretation of the Heisenberg principle, the very act of observing something changes it. So if we're going out there and writing stuff down, we're already affecting that which we are observing and to go out and then tout it and, and pump it and pump it up and try to, you know, use it as a, uh, you know, as a way to gain notoriety. You're just, you're, you're skewing, you're skewing the phenomenon or the phenomena um, even more. So I am very, very hands off, very laissez faire when it comes to um, promoting myself trying to create a cult of personality that is not the way to go about investigating these, these um, wonderful subjects. Um, I think people need to um, f stop with the eight second attention span. And that's probably being overly yeah. generous. It's probably more like <laughs> let me jump in for a moment. I think it's gone down. <laughs> yeah. Let me jump in for a moment and to say, uh, just to add to what I said and what Chris has said, this entire kind of neurotic drive mechanism is fueled by something that really didn't exist even 10 years ago. Yeah, sure. Um, conspiracy is a very real thing. You, the definition is essentially two or more individuals plotting something in secret, usually with nefarious aims. Um, I am not a conspiracist, but I know that history has been defined by them. However, we now live in a time where the most powerful leader in the world is not just a subscriber to some of the <laughs> loopiest conspiracy theories imaginable, but has kind of given tacit permission and set a tone internationally that if you've got a conspiracy theory, who knows, it might be true. In other words, your fantasy or um, your wild idea is equal in weight yeah. to my actual knowledge based on study. This is right. a terrible thing. It's part of the whole anti-intellectualism drive right. alive and very well in yep. this country yep. right now, very dangerous yeah. thing. The other thing is, while agreeing with Chris in principle, um, there are people who have earned part of their living. Uh, and in the case of Stan Friedman, um, essentially, as far as I know, the lion's share yeah. of the way that he made he, his He was living, an exception. He was an exception. And yeah. He was a remarkable exception. Um, yeah. I first heard Stan, and to go off on, I think, a valuable tangent, I hope so, um, speak a few years into my obsession with this, my first job unpaid, but 
who cared was to work as an editor on a requested paper by the Secretary General of the United Nations for inclusion in a series of debates around whether or not the UN, under the auspices of the Security Council, should set up a very simple committee to study the UFO question. Um, ultimately, because of uh, the insistence of the, ver uh, the prime minister of the very tiny Caribbean nation, Grenada, it did become uh, an item. And I was there for those meetings. And it was one of the most memorable periods of time in my life. Uh, the resolution passed, by the way, and then was allowed to die in committee. Hmm. But I got to see. Yeah, and he was deposed about a year later. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And then Grenada was overthrown and invaded by Reagan. Um, oh, yeah. And, and the communists were allowed to take over. My point is that there I was, a novice in this, getting to see on the floor of the UN, talking to the delegates had the courage to be there, Stanton Friedman, Dr. Alan Hynek, Jacques Vallée, mm -hmm. uh, a lieutenant um, um, colonel um, I think Lawrence Coyne involved in an extremely famous and brilliantly well-documented helicopter yeah. incident over Ohio in the 70s. Oh, Ohio, yeah. uh, Gordon Cooper was supposed to be speaking, speaking. We had a blizzard in New York a day or two before, and legitimately he wasn't able to get there, but his statement was written in. About 10 years later, mid-80s, 87 or so, I, I began to have an acquaintanceship with Stan, then a friendship, then a mentorship, and I loved the guy. I, I mourned his loss. I just broke into tears. He was a kind, decent, scholarly. Yeah. He was one of the good guys. And he really was. if you're looking for an example in the work to yeah. follow, the other thing is that he happened to be a respected nuclear physicist. So he spoke at like over 600, you know, uh, professional organizations, a zillion colleges and universities. He got invitations that Chris and I would not. And one of the things that he set forward for me as a model was call yourself whatever you want, but you're actually taking on the role of being an educator. Yeah. Um, for most of us that have a public life and are professional communicators, for me, whether it's on film, uh, a show like this, um, writing a book, uh, you know, uh, being in a documentary, I always try to remember that the best way to help people educate themselves, you have to find a hook. Think of your favorite teacher that really impressed lessons on you. And it's not infotainment, but it is you have to be somewhat compelling and interesting and hold yeah. that audience's attention. Yeah. And that's part of the art that we practice. Otherwise, some of the best researchers, God bless them, um, and I'm no names, but they're, they're really dry. boring speakers. <laughs> and that's a real effing problem. Yeah, um, yeah. That, that's what Gary uh, said uh, yeah. when he came back. He was quite disillusioned and his pockets yeah. were empty and his, you know, you know right, Gary? What, uh, I don't want to speak for you, but. No, when I came back, yes, uh, very <laughs> much rare. so. I, uh, I went to contact in the desert oh, wow. and I. <laughs> I'm still waiting to be invited to speak there, by the way. <laughs> I would rather see you there because I, I fell asleep at half the conferences. So man, we're having trip. contact in the <laughs> internet right here, man. We're we're having like this is probably better than your whole uh, your whole trip, Gary. I, I know I had a better time sitting by the pool. Quite frankly, <laughs> I mean, there was a couple of good. There was a, there was some good. You know, uh, seeing Eric Von Daniken, he's kind of crazy, but he was awesome. He was entertaining. Yeah, he, was he is. Funny. He's remarkable. Love he's that a, guy. A machine. Yeah. He's just extraordinary. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he but, also drink you under the table. Uh, oh. I speak from personal experience. Uh, no, oh, that's awesome. That's good. I mean, not really, but that's good. Uh, no, it, it's, I like these conferences because I mean, at least I see one or two things that I like, but it's changed it, And like you got, and, uh, and not for the better. And I, in, and listen, I'm part of this dumb crowd that watches H and aliens. I watch all this stuff. So I'm supporting hey, we've been it, on there, but, but I see what the damage it does too. what Christopher said is, this is the most interesting. These are the most interesting subjects in the world. This is some of the most yeah. important work in the world. That's how seriously yeah. I think we yeah, should take it, it. And you don't need to exaggerate it. It's right. there's there's enough strange that, that you. mundane strange yeah. you're looking yeah. for. Yeah. Uh, right. It's strange. And Christopher, I just heard your story for the first time, and that blew my mind. So 
the little stick men turning sideways and basically being two dimensional. There's a Doctor Who episode that deals with that, by the way, called Flatline, and it's it's creepy yeah. as hell. And, yeah. But it clicks something in your brain that it, the way I, the way the way we deal with the way the the perception of of aliens right now is is it. I think it's a collective consciousness thing. Personally, yeah. I I do uh, too. I, I think they are with you they they are something we can't comprehend at, right. at all and our brain is just trying to fix it and, and listen movies have almost dealt with that with the whole owls looking like aliens i think it's more like aliens look like something else uh and that's why i'm more interested and i like to think you know gill out there in, in subjects like this i'm trying to get more serious about this so uh because it, it is important and this is something i'm going to be into yeah. the rest of my life like you guys once you're hooked in you yeah. can't even you know yeah. Yeah. i don't investigate it every day but i've been reading books for 20 years on the subject now That's i can't great. walk away from it it's right because I, I need to know, even if I it never get answered, I never expect it to get answered. And nowadays, though, you were talking about the deep fake. And sorry, I do talk a lot. Um, the only way I'm going to experience a UFO now is if I experience one. If I if I yeah. actually experience, I'm not going to believe well, anything I see. Uh, there are there are some tricks. Um, fortunately, um, I've been trained by I who, someone who I feel is head and shoulders above any analyst in the field. His name is Ray Stanford. He's one of the original investigators from the late 40s, early 50s. He's still alive. He's in his 80s. Yeah. Mm. And he's done some analytical work and come up with some really interesting ideas of what to look for that include ghost imaging. Um, if you do high mm -hmm. contrast adjustments and some false color, you can often bring out the same object, but it's closer and further away because uh, it appears that these objects are actually existing in compressed time. Mm. And so if you think that they're just, it's just hovering over you like Peter had, they could have been looming right up to him uh, in a 55th of a second. They could have had flown back and checked somebody else out, um, similar to the Star Trek episode where they hear the buzzing in their ears. And it's actually this whole scenario going on around them. And it's all this time is being compressed. So he's come up with uh, some some real science, some real physics to uh, to attempt to explain this. He uh, to give you an example, he was uh, over Mexico with a uniform uh, cloud cover um, below him. He was at thirty thousand feet. The cloud cover was at about twelve, and then sticking up out of the clouds were the tops of the Sierra Madre Mountains. They were flying along. They had an upper cloud layer about uh, ten fifteen thousand feet above them. Uh, he was uh, filming uh, into polarized light. He saw a mothership, and he there was uh, triangles uh, docking underneath it. They were shooting out smaller scout craft. He was shooting out the airliner window at 50 frames per second. Wow. In one frame, an object loomed up within a few hundred yards of the plane, and then the next frame, it's gone. When it loomed up to the plane, the probably the gravitational field of the object optically collapsed the horizon behind wow. it oh. and the amount the amount of energy it would take to do that yeah. the mountaintops disappeared down into the cloud layer for just one well it, it actually there was a, a slight lag uh when the thing went away it took them a while uh for the light to to to, to go straight into the lens Whoa. so there was another frame where they're coming back up but he he's gonna um, he's gonna really create a stir when he uh, comes out with his uh, his data. So there there are ways there are ways to uh, to identify these craft. These craft do not travel on edge on like this. They travel like this, and they travel uh, usually the the top is is away from the direction of travel. The top cupola if it's a saucer type craft and they aren't saucers, they're spinning and they're polygonal. Mm, um, it's another that's... thing that most people don't know. These craft are uh, multi-sided and uh, it's because of the spinning action that creates the, the illusion of, uh, of, 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 of circular uh, diameter. Another thing uh, is that they generally, if there's any sort of moisture in the air, you're going to have a plasma sheath around the craft because it's ionizing the air sure. around yeah. it. 
and you're not going to see, you see a, a craft on this uh, third phase of moon guys, this craft over the Pacific ocean. And there's, there's, there's no plasma around it at all. You know, almost instantly that it's fake. There's very few atmospheric conditions set up over a large body of water, like an ocean. That's not going to have an elevated amount of moisture. That's going to be ionized uh, by the, uh, and, and become an ionized plasma yeah. by the, uh, the, the magneto hydrodynamic emitters that are around these things. Um, so that, you know, we're because of Ray's work and, and, uh, because of, uh, of some other uh, scientific work that's being done, we're starting to get an idea of how these things actually operate. And we're starting to dive into the realm of propulsion diagnostics. So, um, I wouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater yet. There, there are some ways to, to separate the wheat from the chaff. It, yes. I, I believe I have some wheat for you both, gentlemen. Give me hope. Uh, I, me hope. I yes. actually, <laughs> uh, for the first time in my life, saw a UFO, uh, captured it on, on my cell phone. But but the circumstances of it are, are fascinating because I think they tie directly into what you're talking about. Uh, and I showed this, this shot. Uh, I got two shots, but the two shots in and of themselves are also interesting. So we speak about consciousness. And we spoke about, uh, you know, the Copenhagen interpretation and so on. I was being driven to a doctor's appointment at the time. I was on Valium. And I was not stoned, but I was, I was you know, somewhat relaxed. I noticed this, this object uh, in the sky. I got out my, fumbled out my phone. I took two shots of it. Uh, one of them came out it's the same object almost the same distance one of them comes out it's like a little haze it is not at all what i saw then another shot it came out as clear as day it was a a tic-tac like thing with portals going along the side as clear as a bell and i i wonder you were talking about the angle of view christopher uh I, they, I saw it but my cell phone did not register it at what angle. And then on the next angle, clear as a bell. Hmm. And I'm just wondering, you know, you spoke about how observation impacts reality. Well, what does that imply about reality? Doesn't that suggest that consciousness is a tangible force and yeah. that we do not Absolutely. understand uh, that we may actually, who knows? I mean, you know, if, if, you know, I study Eastern philosophy and so on. If uh, if Vedanta has any validity to it and there's a root consciousness that is the underlying basis of existence, then as kind of coordinates of that, we might sometimes ourselves invoke these these sort of things. And I'm just curious yeah, about I how agree. you do that. Yeah. Um, before we proceed, I just want to um, say, having nothing to do with the show, but I don't want to freak any of your viewers out. Um, I have glaucoma. It, it's um, an eye disease. It's completely um, being treated. If it was 80 years ago, I'd be blind or going blind. Uh, my dad had it for over 50 years and still saw well enough to uh, do anything that needed to be done until he died at 98 and a half years old. The oh. thing is, I have to take time out to put in eye drops. And after I do, I have to hold pressure for two minutes so it doesn't run down the tear duct. So ignore me and continue on. That's absolutely okay. Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for letting us know. But yeah, please take care of yourself. That comes first. Ah, just kidding. Absolutely. And someone in the chat, I just want to bring this up because this is kind of, you know, what we deal with uh, yeah. when we address these topics. Somebody says, well hung in dung, says, so you saw a UFO while you were on Valium uh -huh, oh, and got it on my phone. Well hung uh, in dung. So well, your phone may a have been on Valium. Too. Don't hallucinate Let's on Valium. That's right. So Use know. a little bit of common sense okay, and actually got, listen to what's I've, being said. I've got one for you. My first real UFO sighting was the third uh, Friday of September 1979 up in New Paltz, New York. I was tripping on mushrooms. Ah, and, two, well. two, and two other friends of mine were tripping on mushrooms. I mean, faced. Uh, I mean, really faced. <laughs> I, I, I'm a heroic dose person. Um, I do two, three, four times as much as everybody else 
Uh, or I used to. Let's put it that way. I used to. <laughs> I'm right there. In the 60s, I swear to God, one of the watchwords was, if you don't know what it is, only take half. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I knew exactly what these were. and But what's interesting is um, I was with a group of five people, three of uh, five other people. So there were six of us. Three of us were tripping, and the other three of us were not. Uh, and we all shared the same interaction with six or seven objects way up in the sky mm. that were tracing out forms like these forms on my shirt. We did a, a, a triangle, a circle, a square, and um, a, a cross sign. These are the symbols that they use for uh, testing people for their uh, psychic abilities. And uh, I was going to ask you about that. There you yeah. go. And uh, we were on the football field at New Paltz University after a very good Gentle Giant concert. Uh, the three that weren't tripping might as well have been after seeing that band. <laughs> they, they were amazing. Anyway, we had this incredible experience, and we had a double bind situation going on with my brother standing away from the group with his back to us. And we were tracing out. We were aligning ourselves on the field in these various shapes, and the craft in the air were mimicking our shapes that we oh, were. Oh, and, and we cool. thought that this was so cool. And then somebody goes, "Well, why are you up so high? Why don't you get closer?" And either they flared or they came hurtling down at us. And someone said, "Not that close," mm -hmm. and they stopped and went back up again. And uh, after a while, you know, I when I I was the one that first saw them, and I I was looking at the stars going wait a minute, all those other stars, I don't see them kind of moving around. Why are those stars right up there kind of moving around, milling around a little bit? And so I asked somebody, hey, look straight up. Tell me what you see. And they said, those stars are moving. And so uh, so we had we had a fun time uh, with the, uh, you know, playing with the UFOs. And then we got, our, I think our ride came and, and we went off to the party that we were... Uh, <laughs> That's the way it is sometimes. I know. <laughs> that, but uh, everybody, and we shared the same exact experience, even though three of us were faced and the other three of us were not. Well, you know what? That's It's as simple as having seen a car crash. If three of you were high and two of you weren't, it's a real thing. It happened. You've got right. a reality check between you. Right. And, you know, life goes on. That's the way it is. Yeah. I wonder if one altered state of consciousness opens some kind of avenue where, I mean, it's not that it's imaginary. It's simply that it, it opens up an opportunity for something mm -hmm. to manifest that is observable uh, by people who are not in an altered state of mind. I, I, I think that there's something potentially to that. Um, I also think getting back to your idea of how consciousness may have an inner relationship with phenomenal events. I think that these things that we're lumping together as the paranormal or UFOs or ghosts or these types of um, unexplained events, I think a lot of these things, uh, if not most of them, um, are actually um, sketches, and we're filling in the details and, and coloring in the, uh, uh, the, 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 the shading on them. I think that it's almost like we're watching a blank canvas with a slight sketch on it, and based on our front-loaded preconceptions and expectations surrounding these types of events, that we uh, are in a co-creative uh, sort of uh, symbiotic relationship with the phenomena. And someone who's been doing a lot of work on this, Greg Bishop, um, has come up with an idea called the co-creation hypothesis, which is something, you know, people have been talking about for years, but he's he's actually really uh, uh, quantifying it and, and really digging into yes. this. And I've always felt that there was uh, some sort of symbiotic, uh, you know, uh, give and take relationship between the observer and what they're observing, even if it's not a phenomenal event. Uh, I, I think that they're, you know, our, our reality is, is uh, you know, we're seeing a very thin slice of the energetic spectrum. I mean, we're just seeing the very center yeah. uh, in a very, very small uh, percentage of the actual physical, um, you know, electrical spectrum. And, and uh, I mean, it goes all the way up, you know, to the, to the to super high, high uh, frequency to super, super low uh, into in, what is it? Inf uh, infrared all the way up to uh, uh, infrared. 
You know, you bring up a very good point there, Chris. Setting the paranormal aside for the moment, the bodies, the bioenergetic systems that we have, the incredible complexity in, you know, the wiring of every human organism, you know, uh, other forms of life as well, in itself is breathtaking. And at the same time, what we generally call perception in the routine way is I have these two eyes that work on a rod and cone system. They're both looking in the same direction at the same time. There's only a relative field, uh, infrared being you know exclusive to that, um, that they can perceive at the same moment. A dog hears better than us. A lot of animals run faster. We live in a very hyper-specific uh, temperature zone. If it's a few degrees too cold, we will perish. If it's a few degrees too hot, we will perish. And um, we have language, um, which is often a poor enough tool to express yourself. Uh, we're, we start out very limited in a way. Um, one of the things um, psychedelics uh, can offer people, especially if properly timed and, you know, if uh, there's not a lot of stuff that's going to come up to, uh, you know, uh, upset the, the situation, is there's definitely a retracting of the physiological armor. There's an opening to the wonder of the myriad of things going on around you that normally you would completely ignore. And if they're profound enough, you will remember them you will remember enough of them or it will stay in your pre-conscious where you will bring those sensitivities and awareness into your general sphere. Um, and that's just what I'll call the normal as opposed to the paranormal range. Yeah. I totally agree with that, Peter. Uh, the, the reason I started getting into this subject is I took psychedelics as a kid. I don't, I'm sober now, but uh, I don't regret it. I had a good time. They're not for everybody. Uh, but they did change me. Like after I uh, went through some journeys with some friends, had some good times, you know, mostly, I, you know, mostly had some good times, but it did profoundly change me after the come down. I thought about yeah. what I experienced, what I saw, and I looked at the world differently. And it's, it's really, it's hard for me to explain. Cause I didn't, you know, <laughs> it's been years, uh, but I definitely, I mean, you know, squeegeed my third eye open and I saw the world differently and yeah. I was more open-minded to things I wasn't before. And I'm not saying I had an understanding. I just was open to more. So yeah. they're not the devil, as, as a lot of people say. Again, they're not for everybody. They can be incredibly dangerous for some people, too. Uh, it just depends on the situation. Like Peter said, sound mind and body, being with some good friends. But uh, definitely, I, I, it's something that, uh, not, not cocaine. No, <laughs> I'm looking in the chat and I just see cocaine. No, no, it's a hell of a drug. Um, no, uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's. It's not something to poo-poo, and uh, to what Doomcock, uh, just to reiterate, uh, Valium, you don't you don't hallucinate on Valium. Uh, you 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 are it, it doesn't cloud it, it messes with your judgment a little bit, bit but not your sight, uh, not not what you actually see, uh, especially in the sky. And I saw the picture, and it's bizarre. A everything about it is bizarre. But those to me now are the more believable cases. If it looks if it looks like a saucer, I'm going to question it. Uh, and that's just where I'm at personally, uh, because I've seen so much fake, you know, fakery. And I, I, I went to all those channels you were mentioning, but they're, they're you're right. They're filled with because they have to fill time. And I understand that they want to consider all possibilities, but it takes away from the real stuff. And I want to get focused back on the real stuff or at least yeah. Yeah. the, the yeah. ground level investigation, considering all ideas being trying to be as scientific as possible, uh, although science has been dogmatic in a lot of ways, the way these guys go about their business and Stanton went about his business. And again, uh, we miss Stanton. So uh, yeah, so so they're not bad. They're not good, but uh, they did a uh, snow flame. Everybody's mentioning snow flame. That's an inside joke for the show, but uh, no, thanks for talking about that, Peter. I appreciate that. Absolutely. I would, I don't know. Look, we could talk forever. I mean, you guys are, are some of the best conversation I, I've had, uh, certainly on this show. It's, it's astonishing. You guys are fantastic. Uh, but I do want to be sure 
and mention, uh, Peter, you've got a documentary and, and Christopher, you have written a hell of a book. Uh, <laughs> Peter, you, sure you've is. got one coming out uh, about the death of James Forrestal and Christopher, you've got Stalking the Herd, which is available on Amazon. And I want to be sure and, and touch on those before we, we go much further. Uh, let I, I think that the, the Forrestal uh, issue, well, I don't, uh, who wants to go first? I'll just leave it to you guys. Chris. Wow. Um, yeah, I've got a bunch of things going on. Um, in, in addition to stalking the herd, which is, you know, being called the, you know, the, the Bible of the cattle mutilation mystery, but simply because I was able to coalesce 12, diff, 12, uh, databases together, uh, to, to come up with a complete picture, uh, a case history of the phenomenon and, we have cases that go all the way back to 1605 in London. Um, and uh, also uh, it deals with uh, our relationship with cattle and um, and the implications of uh, these cattle deaths in the modern age. Um, but I also have something called UFODAP, which is the UFO Data Acquisition Project, yeah. which I've been working with a um, an, an extremely brilliant um, inventor and uh, computer scientist and engineer. And we've come up with um, customized software that allows you to take uh, multiple cameras, high def pan, tilt and zoom cameras, um, and, um, and have an actual triangulated array set up to capture aerial events. And when an event occurs, you have um, a detect motion, identify what the motion is, it's discriminating. Uh, then it will uh, track the motion, and then uh, all all the cameras will zero in on the event. And um, we also have a, a multi-sensor package that has a magnetometer, a gravitometer, uh, and then um, a complete atmospheric uh, levels, barometric pressure, temperature, um, et cetera. And, um, and then you can also plug in uh, other uh, instruments. Now, all this stuff uh, gets recorded. So um, you can literally, with GPS, you can, on a map, you can see exactly where the object is, how large it is, how fast it's going, what its azimuth is, altitude, um, luminance, uh, whether it's uh, exerting some sort of field effect in the Earth's magnetic field, whether it's, it's, uh, it's playing around with gravity. Um, this is the first time that a full-functioning scientific uh, documentation uh, you know, a multi-sensor pack has ever been made available to the public. Um, and it's, I'm so proud of the job that, uh, that my, uh, my partners have done on this. Uh, we, we already have a, uh, um, the first part of the system up in the San Luis Valley where I investigated all during the nineties. Uh, we have a system going in next door to the Skinwalker Ranch in Utah. We have a system uh, already in Italy, Assist, another system in northern uh, Utah. We have a camera in uh, San Pedro, California. Uh, we have another camera that's going in up near uh, Mount Adams. Um, so we're we're already on the way uh, uh, to get these uh, systems up and, and operating. They totally operate over the internet. So um, what we're going to be able to do is um, is collect um, data from these um, unique events and then gradually um, get a database together and, and do some, uh, you know, uh, profiling of patterns and uh, pattern recognition. And uh, ultimately, hopefully, we'll be able to, you know, duplicate our, uh, our data and um, be in a position to actually start to publish inside sci uh, scientific papers. Um, this is a huge, huge step forward. Uh, for the field of ufology, I often joke that I'm, you know, I'm. Don't call me a ufologist. I'm not one of those people. Uh, <laughs> but if I was a ufologist, this is exactly what I would be doing: is, <laughs> is, is coming up with a way to take the naysayers and slam dunk them uh, with with, with uh, you know, and some skeptical science scientists and uh, say, okay, uh, check this out. And then, oh, you, okay, you got one event, big deal. No, we got three or four events. Check these out. Now, if we're able to do this, 
Uh, this is it, it's just a whole new ball game. And yeah. what's what's amazing is if I had tried to do this 20 years ago, it <laughs> would have been impossible. Yeah. It would have cost almost a million dollars. We now have uh, full blown top of the line systems available for less than five grand. And entry level systems for just over four hundred. Wonderful. So uh, this is really, uh, this is kind of where my head's been at lately. Unfortunately, one of the principals uh, who I worked with for twelve years uh, before um, our engineer Ron Olch got involved about five years ago, um, we lost him uh, to to cancer uh, last year. I'm sorry. And so yeah, we're we're taking the uh, the ball and running uh, with it today. Actually. Um, Ron is uh, in Hollywood. He's, he lives in Van Nuys, and he's doing a shoot with uh, Josh. Uh, uh, what's his name? The, you know, Expedition uh, Unknown guy, Josh Gates. Um, they uh, featured our system on a earlier episode of um, uh, in Investigation X, which is a new spinoff show, and they're doing a follow-up show with uh, with the Granddaddy Show on on Discovery. Uh, this is a big deal. Um, uh, this is really, <laughs> I'm so proud to be the first one to actually actually uh, be part of a team that has uh, finally finally come up with a recourse for the average guy to actually be a scientist in this field. So. Now I'm off my uh, soapbox here. No, that's a good soapbox <laughs> to be great. on. We've been needing yeah. that for so yeah. long. That is yeah. absolutely incredible. And what is the uh, – now you've got a web address for this uh, UFO project. What is exactly. it? It's a UFO D-E-A-P, UFO Data Acquisition Project. So it's ufodap.com. And there's also a GoFundMe uh, site on there where – this is, you know, we're not making money with this. We're actually just doing this to, to get our costs back. Um, we're, we're um, y y we might as well be a nonprofit organization, even though we're not. We might as well be because uh, n none of us are making any money doing this. Uh, we're, we're trying to, to keep the price as absolutely dirt, uh, you know, rock bottom as possible. So we get more systems out there. Uh, we have interests from all over the world, uh, Switzerland. Um, again, another uh, radio astronomer in, in Italy has contacted us. Um, we've got the uh, uh, we now uh, Ron has been asked to uh, join the uh, the SCU, the um, the I forget what it is, the Scientific Coalition of U yep. Ufology. I'm a member. Uh, they um, they are uh, he will be doing a presentation at their next uh I think a post board presentation at their next conference. So this is really, this is exciting. This is uh, the most excited I've been about the field of ufology since I uh, met Ray Stanford and started getting, <laughs> getting into picking his brain. Uh, he's, he's another one that's uh, definitely a major, major, uh, you combine those two uh, UFO DAP and Ray Stanford. He's one, he's our main analyst uh, for the uh, information. Great. Um, so um, that's kind of where I've been at. And uh, thanks for asking. Absolutely. That is a fantastic project. Uh, I, I am thrilled that you're tackling that. I also want to mention uh, www.rstrangeplanet.com, which is your website as well. Yeah. And uh, people should go and check both of those websites out. Uh, this is some fantastic work that Christopher is doing. And I urge you guys to, uh, to support him in it. Uh, Thank you. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, Peter, what about uh, your documentary that is coming out? Well, um, technically it's out already, but not fully available. Um, mm -hmm. I first uh, became interested in the life and uh, the circumstances surrounding the death of our first Secretary of Defense, James Vincent Forrestal, in 1987. Uh, at that point, I was beginning years of investigation into England's Rendlesham Forest incident, and I came and went from a number of other projects. It's one that never lost its hold on me. Um, I, I began a fair amount of my investigation in the New York Times newspaper morgue and in the main branch, uh, New York City Public Library, one of my favorite places in the world, uh, when it was still all digital. And you know, you would look up an article in a big ledger, copy down the code numbers, take it to the microfiche person, you know, like for a lot of us ancients in high school, get the microfiche, find it, put the dime or the quarter in the machine and print out, closest thing I've ever had to 
slot machine <laughs> sensibilities. Uh, I don't gamble on that sense. And uh, then when it all went digital, continued to download articles as I was doing with other things. Anyway, um, I didn't give my first talk on Forrestal until 2004, contributed my first article to a publication after that, wrote my first conference paper, and I've published a number of things over the years. About three years ago, uh, when my, my career had kind of imploded in a certain level, it sort of superimposed itself on uh, my father's declining health. And I went from being kind of a companion to a part-time caregiver to the last few years before he passed a full-time caregiver, all just fine with me and the way it should be. I had a great dad and certainly it was karma and payback. But I began to think, where do I start again? And what's my goal re, re, kind of uh, reevaluating? Uh, people like Chris and I overwhelmingly, whatever the forum, we're preaching to the choir. We're talking to people who have a pre-interest in what we're doing. How do any of us break out of that? For me, that question um, really uh, compelled me to kind of pull back a bit and think about how I might capture or begin to address another audience. Um, I had the great privilege and an awful lot of fun um, throughout most of the 1980s and into the 90s of being the house manager for, at the time, New York City's most distinguished repertory company. Uh, there's nothing like live theater. And I had an opportunity to work with actors who were Tony Award winners and Academy Award winners and names you don't know, but faces you grew up with in film and television. And I began to think about theater audiences and not necessarily Broadway or off-Broadway where I work, but regional theater, high school theater, uh, school plays, people who will go and see a live performance. It's a very mixed bag. It can be perfectly common to have somebody there with the 10th grade education sitting next to somebody with two PhDs. And I thought, I don't want to, I'm not a playwright, although I think it'd make a fine play. I'm not a screenwriter. And I hope when a movie is made about James Forrestal's life that somebody calls me and I get a chance to consult and hope for some accuracy. But I thought, I'm a good enough writer that I could write a script and um, deliver it in kind of a natural way, film it um, with images, but not in the, the sense of um, the way you work, Chris and I work when giving a conference. You've got your remote now, and you know it's time for the image to come up on the wall to illustrate the next thing that you're saying. I wanted to be able to focus on the audience and um, to not get in the way of my feelings as they came up. Um, as a speaker, anybody that's seen me speak knows that I'm like a reincarnated member of the Politburo. You've got to sort of shoot me to get me to stop. I can go <laughs> on for several hours without a note card. Those of us that know our material can. Other times, I will literally script myself and half memorize it and come and go from it because there's so many details. Anyway, I wrote a script. <clears throat> I workshopped it um, in New York City several years ago. Um, at the home of a friend who had a particularly large apartment, large enough to accommodate like 20, 25 people in their living room, hmm. then did a more refined version for a great regional um, UFO group in Rochester, New York, the UFO meetup group there, terrific group. And then in Philadelphia for my dear friend and colleague, Jennifer Stein's um, group. Um, and that's called Mainline MUFON, although it's completely independent and separate from MUFON per se. Um, if Jennifer's name rings a bell for some of you, she is the brilliant filmmaker who was responsible for the conception and the making of uh, the outstanding documentary, Travis, the true story of Travis Walton. Uh, she was assisted by one of my favorite people, Bob Terrio, a brilliant cameraman and tech guy. And before I performed it, um, before I gave the talk that night um, for Jennifer's group, she said, you know, I have uh, my, my downstairs studio, uh, shooting studio, yep. She said, and I have a new toy. It's called a, a teleprompter, if you ever work with one. I said, no, but I'm familiar with what they do. She said, we have green screen 
Bob's coming over. I've got an assistant coming over. Do you want to try to shoot this now? I'd never used um, a teleprompter in my life, and I had a talk to give in a few hours. I was, if I was going to film it, I thought I'd do it the way I gave a talk with that script in my hand, making no uh, point, you know, try, not trying to hide the fact that I was coming and going from it. Um, and so she set up the teleprompter and we went green screen. Then she and Bob moved in to take over uh, the finishing of the project. And what they did was remarkable. They took more than 150 images I had spent years, if not decades, collecting. We then um, got film footage. Uh, Bob produced it brilliantly. And although the copies, the handful of some dozens of copies that people may have of the DVD were, you know, made one at a time, it was a big professional order that will be coming out very shortly with um, English subtitles for hearing impaired people, word for word, I might add, and Spanish subtitles. And we may add more to it in previous editions. Um, the thing I want to... Um, the point I want to make here before giving you instructions on, you know, how you could order it if you want it um, and how you will be able to, and within a month or so, it will be downloadable. And that I'm really looking forward to because folks that don't have $20, which includes shipping, uh, for a DVD, you know, be able to do it for a fraction of that. I wanted to produce something that was not directed at you or anybody in ufology or the giant audience that follows it. Don't get me wrong, I hope you guys and they watch it, like it, learn from it. But I thought the only way to go here is to do something unlike anything I've ever done, that on the surface not only seems safe and almost academic, but um, very low key and a little bit dry. It's the most subversive UFO related product or <laughs> project I've ever gotten involved in. It's essentially me for an hour speaking directly to you on camera, nicely in a tie and jacket with the images going by a old fashioned soundtrack that's sometimes quite patriotic. Um, me disappearing, me coming back, dissolves, film footage, etc but in methodically chronological order. James Forrestal was born in 1892, and it's not until 1947 that I mention in passing that in the state of Washington on June 24th, the private pilots saw objects, and then a week, week and a half later, something or things crashed on a plateau some miles from a small town in New Mexico called Roswell, and then continuing blithely on. By that point, and I should say on the packaging and in the promotion, there's no mention or reference whatsoever to UFOs or any kind of anomalous phenomena. It's an historical telling of a very, I think, important post-war story about a man that America has overall forgotten who people need to know about. Yeah, who had but, a very suspicious demise. <laughs> yes. Well, he was murdered. Yeah. I, I've spent years yeah. of my life yeah. consulting the little lawyer that lives in the left side of my mind. Yep. And actually running it by a number of people uh, with degrees in the law, uh, as well as other researchers and historians. I think it's one of the finest things I've ever done. And again, it's an hour. Um, the production values are very simple. You know, I think about uh, Travis, the true story of uh, the wonderful um, documentary we're looking toward in September. Uh, Jamie Foxx's uh, wonderful piece that's coming up. Another one that should be quite as extraordinary, but not as well promoted right now, um, that um, uh, Randall Nickerson, uh, a wonderful researcher, right. filmmaker, the, investigator, the and a, a dear yeah. soul brother and friend of mine going back decades, specifically on the one of the most important events and well-documented of all time that uh, a lot of people know about, a lot of people don't, the Zimbabwe, uh, Africa, uh, UFO incident involving children who are re-interviewed as adults, et cetera. Um, but again, for me, the idea here was to, by the time, hopefully in the narrative, when the UFO subject comes in, if somebody is watching it, knows that it's nonsense, they're already hooked on the story and they'll tolerate my telling it. 
Um, it's essentially a, a four. You're a evening. subversive. That's exactly. what you are. <laughs> well, I am. And I thought this is the way to do it. And um, essentially, you can go online and go to a website called onwings.com. That's W I N G E S. And then find the Forrestall link, go to it, and you will literally be ordering it directly from me. Uh, and I will be happy to sign or inscribe it. A month from now, uh, you still will have that option, but you'll be able to order it on eBay and from uh, other platforms. Um, and yes, bottom, Peter, I've, I've put that link into the chat. Oh, and, that's great. Uh, Thank you. Uh, several times. Also, Christopher, I've put in the link to your book, uh, Stalking the Herd, as well as your UFO project. Uh, both of those links, uh, gentlemen, I, I'm promoting, and I urge... Uh, all of you listeners out there support these guys. I mean, you can hear the the passion and the knowledge uh, of of decades uh, in their voices. These are folks that deserve a lot of your support, and uh, they have a lot that is very interesting to say. Obviously, I mean, we could go. I, oh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> we, could, we could go all day. We could do a twenty four hour stream with yeah. these guys and still uh, have yeah. stuff to say. Way more than awesome. that. Yeah, we were <laughs> real stuff and just make up some stuff. <laughs> that's right. Well, <laughs> Gary, we never do that, do we? <laughs> no, we get accused of it. But no. <laughs> we get accused of it. We never do it. But <laughs> you guys are are fantastic, and yes. uh, I, I tell you, uh, just uh, each of you. Uh, I mean, we've got the the facts out about you know your your documentary and and about your your website. I think you did a very good job talking about your website, Christopher. Uh, maybe speak just a little bit about uh, stalking the herd and and uh, you know the the work that you have in there, uh, Peter. If you could give a little bit more color about uh, you know James Forrestall in yes. terms of the the whole situation of murder. I don't you know you don't want to give away everything, but I mean just just kind of you know, the, the broad strokes. And then we've got a whole bunch of folks that have sent in super chats. that would love to ask you guys some questions. Is that sure. okay? Sure. Yeah. Um, briefly, mm -hmm. uh, James Forrestall was born in a small town in upstate New York called Madawan, now incorporated into a larger community. Uh, Irish American family, one of three brothers, excelled at sports, was a, a good basketball player, passionate amateur boxer, and ultimately professional level tennis player and a competitive golfer. Uh, he was able to um, uh, qualify to enter Dartmouth uh, College in 1913, transferred to Princeton the next year. The young men that he went to Princeton with in many ways were sons of the ruling class. And he knew early on that he wanted the good life. Uh, he made friends and colleagues there that many of them uh, continued throughout life, uh, became editor of the Daily Princetonian. And then three weeks before he was um, to graduate, he left school, joined the United States Navy and went to Canada to train with the RAF to be a fighter pilot in World War I. The armistice came in before he uh, uh, was able to get into battle. He returned to America, but not to Princeton. He went to Wall Street and he began a, a business career. Uh, he did very well, uh, joined a firm called Dylan Reed by 1926, the Roaring Twenties. He um, had become president of the firm uh, on uh, Dylan's death, uh, married um, a socialite uh, editor at Vogue, former Ziegfeld Follies showgirl. It seemed like one of those great kind of uh, great Gatsby sort of marriages but it was hollow. Um, he was um, he was a player, and um, he thought he was getting into an open marriage. That was not really her idea. Ultimately, she resigned herself to it, had her own affairs, but it was a very empty marriage, and their two sons did not do well in life. Uh, however, um, he was one of the few heads of brokerages in the 19 when the crash happened in 29, to not only keep the, the organization up and going, but to continue to make money for his clients. So much so that by the um, 36 or so, when we were beginning to come out of the depression, one of his old schoolmates at Princeton, uh, a very prominent uh, banker named Ferdinand Eberstadt, uh, who was an advisor to President Roosevelt at the time, 
cut the introduction to Roosevelt, and the president invited Forrestal to come to Washington to join the so-called kitchen cabinet, also known as the dollar a year men. All men, all white, uh, all millionaires or equivalents heading major firms. It was a prestigious thing, and um, they were paid one dollar a year, hence the name to be at the service of the president. One by one, they all returned to their private lives and making money. Forrestal never did. He spent the rest of his life in Washington. Uh, he was made Deputy Secretary, uh, Assistant Secretary of Navy in the pre-war days before we uh, entered World War II, was in charge of supervising and uh, overseeing the procurement of every single thing that the Navy needed. From a sailor's cap to a battleship, he thrived in high stress atmospheres. Uh, in 44, when the Secretary of the Navy had a heart attack and died, he became the Secretary of Navy. He must have driven some of his underlings at the Pentagon crazy because he was no poser. He kept putting himself in harm's way as a cabinet position holder. He was at the Battle of Leyte Gulf, uh, the Battle of Tokyo Bay. He was at a Iwo Jima. He returned to Washington at the end of the war and to a loveless marriage. Um, and Roosevelt, of course, passed in April of 1945. President Truman asked him to undertake an extraordinary assignment. I guess such things have happened since possibly before, but never that I'm aware of as a passionate amateur uh, historian of 20th century history, among others, um, that a responsibility of this magnitude was put into the hands of one man. What Truman wanted him to do was dismantle the War Department, an entity that had been in effect since the 1770s, and create something new that was going to be called the Department of Defense. He did it brilliantly. And after Harry Truman nominated him in 1947 to become the first Secretary of Defense, the House and the Senate um, uh, um, basically voted on it and he was um, approved by acclamation. Nobody voted against him. Can you imagine something like that happening in modern times? And he was the right guy for the job. This is where the story takes a very dramatic twist. Again, late June, uh, we have the Kenneth Arnold sighting, uh, arguably the beginning of the modern age of UFO uh, sightings and uh, era. And then a very short time later, we have Roswell. He takes over this position, the second most powerful man, more than the vice president in the Western world, literally. Uh, he was able to make policy. He was in charge of the largest, most powerful military in the history of the world. Let's say going back 10 or 20,000 years. Well, let's say 7,000 years. 40,000 years ago. I'm not sure what was going on here and whether we had better weapons, but I don't mean to go off on a tangent. Mm -hmm. um, this material, two months old at Tops, it was there waiting for him on his desk. And we're not going to get to it today, probably, uh, except cursorily, the so-called MJ-12 working group around Truman, which I, I am convinced was real. But other than the eight-page briefing document to President um, uh, Eisenhower from 1952, and the one-page attached letter from September of 47 from Truman to Forrestal on his first or second day of work, I am, uh, as Stanton Friedman used to say, the hundreds of pages of relative um, uh, MJ-12 documentation, much of it remains in my gray box. I think some of it's specious. I think some of it is brilliant disinformation. I mean, brilliant. So so much so that it's as interesting as the, the reality of the uh, <laughs> the working group. He was MJ-12 number two. Oh. James Forrestal um, was nothing if not an old-fashioned patriot. He loved this country. He would have given his life for it. He made that very clear in 1917 or so when he went into the Navy and trained to be a pilot. Uh, a uh, occupation with a very high probability of being vaporized. And he served two presidents who I'm sure he would have given his life for. Ultimately, he had a character quirk, I won't call it a flaw, um, where he personalized deeply all of his professional successes and failures, 
most of us if we have a bad day at the office, as I mentioned to you guys before we went on the air, or a very bad day at the office or its equivalent, we'll go home, have a drink or whatever, um, kiss your wife, husband, girlfriend, boyfriend, other partner, pet the cat or dog, have meal, watch television, go to bed and try to do better the next day. Forso was not able to reconcile the responsibility that had given by Truman to get to the bottom of this, and it ate him up, so much so that uh, it contributed, I am convinced, to the very public, very tragic, and very profound nervous breakdown that was building up, obviously, behind his very straight Irish face and broken nose. I should say also he had his nose broken in an amateur boxing match when he was young and made the decision not to have it fixed because he thought it would make him look tougher. And it did. Um, ultimately, though, he tried to take his life several times in the days following. He was stopped. He was institutionalized at Bethesda Naval Hospital, the right place for former Secretary of Navy, held essentially in communicado for the first weeks there under a three shift, eight hour a day Marine Guard, and then started treatment and began to recover and recover his will to live. He was scheduled to be released with all of the hospital records that I have seen and all of the personal accounts in out of print memoirs, everybody from his brother to future secretaries of defense and the like, he was getting better. And it would have been only a matter of months where he was going to be recovering privately at a friend's estate. His brother Henry had arranged to have him picked up on the morning of May 22nd, 1949. By coincidence, supposedly, um, 1.30 or so in the morning, his, for the first and only time, his Marine Guard did not show up legend, myth, lore says he may have been uh, drunk. Well, uh, no, um, they had developed almost a father-son relationship and there was talk of having him work for him as a secretary or something. The attendant who was assigned this VIP patient on the 16th floor allegedly forgot to lock his door after looking in on him. He was not there five minutes later. And if we believe the official line, uh, he went from very well on his way to recovery, to instantaneously upon realizing his door was open, having a, going into a profound suicidal depression, walking into the room across the hall, a uh, efficiency kitchen without a secured window, kind of old screen window kind of thing, then took the sash off his bathrobe, tied it very tightly around his own neck, original report said and later proved wrong that he tied the other end to the radiator and tried to hang himself out of a 16th floor window. Then changed his mind, very dramatically indicated by the fingernail scratches all over the window jam, lost his bearing and died. He was wow. murdered, and I spent years, I think, proving it could bring it to a court of law. The documentary that you'll see is kind of a four-part movement. I tell the story of his life. I tell the story post-breakdown to his death, the details of it than my investigation and conclusion. Um, it only scratches the surface, but it's as good a use of an hour in educating yourself to this man who was a truly great American. And UFOs, schmuefos, he has been effectively erased from post-war American history. Uh, and that needs to change. And that was very important reason that I set about on this particular project again, with that covert agenda of bringing the subject of UFOs to people who could care less about it. But I thought one of the things, I, kn I don't believe in false modesty any more than false praise. I know I'm a good communicator. I take a lot of pride in it. But I think I'm best at entry level stuff, getting um, somebody who is undecided, a, a, a reasonable, intelligent, relatively open-minded skeptic through that first door into the foyer and to demystify the whole UFO subject for them to a degree, and then turn them over to my more, nef more nefarious colleagues who will then <laughs> destroy the brain. <laughs> <laughs> One of my, uh, my viewers here, 
uh, Mexican Iron Man, hail Mexican Iron Man, uh, sent a, a super chat that wants to ask you and then another super chat for you, Christopher, that will lead into your answer regarding uh, stalking the herd. Uh, Be right back. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, well, so let's see. He's uh, he stepped away. Well, let me address it to you then, Christopher. Uh, the, the super chat in question was asking you, um, what is the best, this is from Apex Tyrannus, by the way. Thank you, Apex Tyrannus, for that super chat. What is the best physical evidence that you know of regarding uh, cattle mutilations uh, to, uh, well, he said extraterrestrial rather than terrestrial phenomenon, but I mean, uh, I, I guess he would be asking, what is the purpose of the cattle mutilation and who is responsible? Is it simply human beings or is it some other explanation? You know, um, for decades now, there have been a, a, a number of investigators, one in particular, um, who have looked at about 5 to 10% of the data and come up with the idea that aliens are coming to this planet uh, for various reasons, uh, potential reasons. The, the one touted the most often is uh, to, to get genetic material to hybridize uh, the alien's dying race. Um, when I first started uh, investigating the cattle death phenomenon back in 92, 93, it only took me a couple of weeks before I realized that that particular <clears throat> explanation was far too simplistic. Um, I think it's multiple groups are involved in this, and I think each one of these groups is um, perpetrating cases not only for their own agenda, but to throw people off of them onto other agendas that are also uh, attempting to throw their agenda off with red herring cases on others. So there's a multi-layer, multi-group, multi um agenda, for lack of a, a better term, uh, scenario that's going on. I think at the core of the phenomenon, uh, the high strange cases, which may represent as little as 2 or 3% of real cases. Now, now, let me state right up front that out of 200 cattle mutilations that I investigated, 160 of them were, you know, equivocal. They could have been mutes or they probably were scavenger, unusual scavenger action. And out of those 240 of them appeared without question to be uh, perpetrated with intelligence. And out of those 40, about seven, maybe eight were really strange and, and high strange. And those cases uh, are the ones I think uh, your uh, Mexican Iron Man. <laughs> or yeah, that's his name. <laughs> Is, is is referring to the cases that we cannot explain uh, with uh, modern uh, forensic, uh, you know, veterinary forensic science. And there are some. There are not many. Uh, there's only a few anecdotal cases uh, that have anything to do with, with uh, uh, UFO-type craft in conjunction with mutilations. There's a very interesting one from 1999. Fifteen Forest Service workers in Washington State saw a craft... Uh, somehow uh, raise up a, a struggling elk and fly off with the thing underneath. That's a, a pretty interesting case. There's a case in Missouri, a farmer and his wife claim they saw an animal being taken by uh, non-human ent entities aboard a ship. There's the uh, Myrna Hansen and Julie Doherty cases where they were, uh, them and their, uh, in, in Judy's case, her, her child, were taken aboard a craft, and while they were on the table, they looked over, and on the adjoining table was a was a calf. Um, there are stories uh, Thomas Costello, you know, which is I don't buy into a lot of these. Uh, believe me, uh, it claims he was a guard at uh, Nightmare Hall in Dulce, and there were vats of cattle parts and human parts. And um, there's a case supposedly that happened a uh, human mutilation on the White Sands missile testing grounds back in the 50s. Um, a couple of cases of hunters in uh, Idaho, a case that I really tried to get my, uh, uh, you know, dig into uh, in 98 of a, a young teenage girl that was mutilated down in Silver City. There's been some mutilation, uh, mutilations uh, 
apparent mutilations in England. Uh, one of a young girl that I know, there's some pretty awful uh, photographs of her. Um, there's a couple of cases, though, that are very interesting. The Snippy the Horse case, the very first widely publicized yes. case of this type. Yeah. Um, the brain was gone uh, with no break in the cranium. The upper <sighs> respiratory organs were gone with no break through the ribs. Uh, the heart was gone. Uh, there was a strange medicinal smell around the animal. The bones were bleached white like they'd been in the sun for 30 years. I had a case in 98 uh, first weekend of March, a, 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 a fairly young, only um, about a two month old, I think, uh, calf was found in a pristine, fresh five inch snowfall. Its right uh, front leg was gone, the ribs were gone, the spine was gone, the uh, lungs and, and were gone, the heart and liver were surgically excised and laid into the empty body cavity uh, perfectly. Uh, there wasn't one drop of blood uh, on the snow. Uh, there was only one drop of blood that we found on the rear left hoof. The animal wouldn't rot. Uh, the brain was gone with no break in the cranium. The dura or the, the membrane around the, uh, the brain was still intact. Mm. Uh, there was uh, the spine had been broken in an upwards manner uh, from the hip, which would have been impossible because the hide was there. Um, the animal, again, this similar to Snippy, had this uh, faint medicinal smell to it. Um, so there are high strange cases. I think that there's something paranormal. There's something like a predator natural predator, uh, something that's uh, probably responsible for our ancient uh, practice of animal sacrifice. Um, I, I do have a sense that these are the cases that uh, could, could possibly go back uh, deep into history. Um, in 1605, hundreds and hundreds of sheep were mutilated around London during the early part of the reign of James V. Um, I think the majority, though, are human, human perpetrated with scalpels, uh, very, very uh, uh, extremely skilled surgical operations. They seem to be ex uh, uh, real experimental surgeries, uh, excising the soft tissue organs. Um, they can be perpetrated, uh, although one of the top veterinary pathologists uh, tried to duplicate the wounds. He said he said he had a hard time doing it, and he couldn't see anybody uh, without his proficiency to be able to do it. But he said, I, I was able to do it. Uh, I think uh, there's probably a, a fear in the uh, beef industry and in the um, Centers for Disease Control and National Institutes of Health, some sort of quasi-health organization, maybe a military arm that's really concerned about the potential of mad cow disease springing up into the food chain. And I think that that might be the main motivating factor and the main agenda that is creating uh, uh, outbreaks of these cases. If you look at a map of the outbreak of uh, mad cow disease, uh, at least in this continent, and uh, and then you can see the spray of of a shotgun spray of mutilations around these these sites, especially in Alberta. Um, there's a lot of smoking gun evidence. Uh, Colm Kelleher, who was the um, uh, manager of the NIDS organization that uh, owned the Skinwalker Ranch for 15 years, he's a, a molecular biologist. He yeah. wrote a book called brain trust which is really a, an amazingly yeah. well-researched book mm -hmm. and he absolutely proves uh it's in my mind that uh the uh, at least a portion of mutilations are being perpetrated because of mad cow disease and the fear of it in the food chain he also traces the the spread of mad cow disease in deer and elk chronic wasting disease and it suggests that it may have been a weaponized form of a disease a very rare disease found in new guinea called kuru and it was brought over and given to the army chemical corps to play with and it got loose into the environment in 67. Um, my book goes into a lot of details uh, concerning uh, the 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 evolution of theories uh, about who is doing this. Uh, the, uh, the law enforcement thinks it's Satanist uh, because of ufologists, actually. Alan Hynek and, and uh, Jerry Clark and uh, Kevin Randall convinced the ATF to send a, 
a, a notice, a memo to all the sheriff's departments in the country telling them to watch out for Satanists mutilating cattle. And that's where that connection came from. And tracing that back is fascinating. Tracing back the idea of the mad cow connection is fascinating. Tracing back how the alien uh, meme got started is fascinating. I wrote a book looking at all the data. I don't go exclusively with one. I don't have one agenda or drum to bang. I'm, I'm looking at this as objectively as I can. I present all the data without a slant. Um, I was extremely careful to keep it as as uh, even keeled and, and neutral in tone as possible. And uh, I'll tell you, it's really difficult to, to write a case history of the cattle mutilation phenomena when every case is almost exactly the same. It's you really have to learn how to to be a creative writer. <laughs> you've got to you've got to look for those fine distinctions. Well, yeah, yeah. And in in the book, what I do is I when when it's a bunch of, of cases that are pretty mundane, I, I won't go into details. I pick out the cases that refute the debunkers who say all cases are are done by scavengers. Uh, uh, so the cases that I I pick out are the ones that really uh, take that particular. Uh, theory and, and just turns it on its ear. So um, the book was 900 pages when I finished it. I took 300 pages out because I'm going to write a follow-up book that analyzes this book. This is all the data in this book, 600 pages. Yeah. The, the next book will, will be analyzing all the data. Gary, I would like to turn this over to you and uh, allow you to ask your questions uh, about uh, cattle mutilations. And also, uh, we have an expert on skinwalkers here as well. So I thought you might enjoy oh. indulging your curiosity there. But then after that, I'm going to have to turn the show over to our, our fans and our, our super chatters who are dying to ask questions. So uh, you, turn it over to you, my friend, and then I'm going to hit those super chats. Okay. Um I only I only heard half of this as I was doing my research on you guys. Uh, Christopher, you talked about uh, somebody trying to duplicate a cattle mutilation. You want to talk about that? Because that was fascinating. <clears throat> yeah. Um, he was the head of the veterinary college, I think, at uh, Iowa State. Um, I think it's John Andrews. Uh, I, I might be wrong with the name, but there was a whole outbreak of, of cases. Um, this is uh, in the, I think, 78, uh, 79, but possibly uh, 80. Uh, there's just so many of them, it's hard to keep track of them. And um, it was a real fresh case that he heard about. It had only been on the ground for a number of hours, um, pristine condition. They um, they paid to have the animal in, immediately brought to the, to the university. They stuck it on a surgical table. Right next to it, they had a, a, a calf that was uh, uh, used for the purpose of, uh, of, of duplicating the wounds. They killed the calf. Uh, and then he, he proceeded to surgically uh, duplicate all the cuts that were done on the, uh, the calf that was uh, you know, found in the field of the, of the farmer. And he said that he was able easily to do most of them. He said he did have a little problem uh, with the, getting the tongue out of deep in the throat, almost to the, eso or to the esophagus. He said that one was really tough and he, they, they had to have a, you know, he had to have help holding the mouth open so he could get in there. Uh, he said that, that they would have needed some sort of mechanical device if the person didn't have help. Um, he, he said that uh, that that one was rough, but all the others, uh, someone proficient and skilled enough could easily do. He said that the the, the one thing that really uh, impressed him is, is he was in a laboratory uh you know, a sterile environment with all these lights and everything. These cases are done in the dark in the middle of BF nowhere out in a pasture somewhere. Um, there's something a little strange about that. That's, that's why some of us think that uh, the animals are picked up by uh, either helicopters or some sort of craft taken and maybe dropped down through uh, into a semi trailer. Let's say that's parked nearby with no roof. They drop it down on a table, close the roof, turn the lights on, do the procedure open, oh, turn the lights off, open it up, take the thing and then drop it back in a different part of the pasture. So it, it appears to, you, you don't have any tracks or any evidence because they're not, they're not returning it to exactly where it was. We've had cases where animals have turned up 
two miles from where they're supposed to be, uh, four fence lines away from where they're supposed to be. So um, it's it's pretty interesting uh, the amount of work that's actually been done by uh, like crime labs, veterinary pathologists. I used to uh, send samples to John King, who is the head of the uh, Cornell um, Animal um, uh, Veterinary Hospital here in New York. And uh, out of all the, the cases that I sent him, there was only two that he said, I can't explain, you know, what these uh, cuts were. And one of them was that calf that I mentioned that was found in the uh, pristine snowfield. He said, he said, I, I, I cannot, this is totally unknown to me how this happened. And uh, so there you go. Yeah. But that's all it takes. You know, it's that, yeah, it's that just small percentage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's good enough. That's good enough for me. Uh, also, um, real quick, uh, I, I, I don't know if you can do, if anybody can do Skinwalker Ranch real quick. Uh, what is your just general opinion on it? You don't, you know. I was the first investigator up there. <laughs> wow, <laughs> Most see? people forget that. <laughs> I mean, well, I, I, I mean, kind of golden on it. it. The, the, the first outsider <laughs> investigator, um, Junior Hicks had been on the ranch, I think, once, and a guy named Ryan Layton, uh, who was uh, from the region, had been on there. Um, I actually interviewed Terry uh, uh, just just as the article was coming out before the uh, the Desiree News article by Zach Van Eck. Zach called me up and said, hey, let me tell you about this case. This guy really needs somebody to talk to. You're, you're dealing with a lot of similar things there. Could you call him up and maybe help this guy out? And he asked me to come up there. And so I did the four, you know, eight, 900 miles round trip. Went up there the next day. It was 106 degrees. I mean, it was a scorcher. And uh, he walked me around. He showed me uh, some of the uh, the evidence of physical evidence of things that had happened up there. Uh, the tops of his cottonwood trees in one section of the pasture had been shaved off by a craft that came through one of the port portals too fast. Usually, he said they floated through. Really slow, but he said this must have been a rookie driver, quote unquote, because <laughs> he came flying through and he sheared off the top of his cottonwood trees, and all the branches were on the ground, broken off. You could see. I mean, I used to do a, a fair amount of logging, uh, and you know, I've worked with chainsaws and have you know gone up and 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 cut the top soft trees and stuff. These were not cut with any sort of implement; they were broken off. And uh, it had happened about, I think, two or three weeks before. And you could see all the leaves had died, and but but it was fresh. He showed me 14-inch uh, uh, punch marks that had been punched into the hard pan of his. It's very, very dry there. And uh, these, these pod marks had been punched, uh, a triangular pattern of them, uh, about 40 feet uh, on each leg, had been punched into the uh, hard pan. And he had one of the... Uh, um, the guys that uh, work for the mining companies who figure out if if uh, a particular portion of ground can take a certain amount of weight. And he was able to determine through perk tests and other things that the thing that, that made those marks uh, was about the weight of a railroad car, about nine tons. Um, and he showed me these marks. And there's, I mean, you can tell that these things were made, uh, impressions in the ground that they weren't dug and you know, that they were punched punched in the ground by something very, very big and heavy. Um, I was really amazed. I, I he, The guy was had a legitimate fear in his eyes and was really concerned about the safety uh, because he had just recently had, you know, bloody wake up and they had big marks on their thumbs and their blood all over and in the bed. And, you know, his wife had come home and take all the groceries out and put them into the into the cupboards and then she'd go out of the room for a couple of seconds, come back in all the groceries would be back in the bag on the, on the table. I mean, so really some very strange stuff. All, all the, 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 ha the house, all the doors in the house had locks on the inside that led to a hallway that had locks on either side of the uh, end of the hallway. And then the closet in the hallway had a lock on the inside of the closet. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> now what's up with that you know and and when the house uh, when the when the shermans took over they said when they went in there everything was exactly the same as it was when the people that lived there seven years before left oh now if you know anything about indian reservations a house will sit empty for a week and everything all the fixtures the copper 
all the appliances, anything worth any amount of money is stripped out of there instantly. Nothing was touched. There were still dishes in the sink. <laughs> Oh, and they said that was freaky. And the big, uh, they had these big eye hooks, uh, the, you know, the, the eye, uh, big round hooks, uh, screwed in by each door that obviously they had really big, <laughs> ferocious dogs chained at, at both doorways. Uh, I believed him. Um, I, I, he asked me if I could help him uh, get the ranch sold to somebody that would investigate what was going on there. And I said, there's only two people, Lawrence Rockefeller or this guy, Robert Bigelow. And before I could get, uh, get him, I, I got him the number for Rockefeller. But before I could get him Bigelow's number, Bigelow called him up and, and made him an offer he couldn't refuse and bought the ranch. So uh, I, I, I really I think it's a it's a real phenomenon. But in terms of the Skinwalker thing, that's uh, that's I'm, I'm sorry, George and Colin. That's uh, that's I think that's really a. Uh, a convenient sort of tag that's that's now a meme of its you know with a life of its own. The Utes have no no tradition of skinwalkers, and this whole idea that the Navajo sent a skinwalker there, eh, I don't know about that. It's, <laughs> I, I know too much about. I used to you know I spent a lot of time in the Navajo reservation. I used to do trips from Sedona guided tours up to this uh, south rim of the Grand Canyon. On the way back, I'd, I'd stop, you know, on the res at the Cameron Trading Post, and I made friends with a lot of Navajo. And uh, it's, I know I know a lot about skinwalkers, and nothing that goes on up there, uh, with a couple of exceptions, some of the animal sightings maybe, but nah, skinwalkers, they, they don't do that. They don't haunt a location. Uh what they do is they you're more apt to see one walking down the a highway at three in the morning on the middle, in the middle of the res, and then when you offer them a ride, they'll look at you or they won't even look at you. They'll ignore you, and then you say okay, and you, you start to drive off, and then you realize he's running next to you, and it doesn't oh. matter how fast you go, they'll keep up with you. Uh, oh. That's that's a skinwalker encounter. Um, there's I I've talked to law enforcement. <laughs> Uh, on the res, uh, Stanley Milford and, and uh, Jonathan, uh, uh, Stanley and John, they, they yeah. I mean, they, they've, they've told some amazing stories. Um, they had one where um, a guy uh, said there was a coyote that was uh, a weird coyote that was bugging his sheep. And he says, I just shot it, but I think there's something wrong uh, <laughs> with this thing, I, but I'm too afraid to go out there. And so they came, came out there in the morning. And, uh, or, you know, just before light, there was enough light. They tracked the coyote and all of a sudden the tracks turned into drag marks. And there's a guy with a coyote skin, uh, shot in the belly who had bled out. And, uh, and the, the tracks were coyote tracks until they found <laughs> the guy. So, I mean, when a law enforcement official tells you that, and yeah. I have a, a New Mexico state patrolman, tell me a story of the guy running alongside his squad car. So, you know, these skinwalkers are, they use uh, a particular form of cor corpse powder and um, they're like spiritual hitmen. Um, if you have a beef with somebody and you want to do them harm, you hire a skinwalker if you're, you're oh. and it's, it's a Diné tradition. It's Navajo and Apache. Uh, it's, it's not Utes. Uh, and, uh, you know, they have the, the bone magic and, and, they can jump inside you and control all your motor functions, make you go places, say things, do things. You're totally aware, but you can't do anything to stop them. Um, there, there's a really good uh, 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 Robbie Robertson song off his third solo album called Skinwalker. And I love the line, takes you to his secret place and drinks the tear right off your face. Um, it's it's a type of, uh, it's, uh, it's the blackest of the three types of Navajo or Diné witchcraft. It's called the way and uh, to become one. Um, I know somebody that actually was trained to be one. And when he found out his, uh, his initiation was he had to kill uh, the, his, his relative closest to him and then uh, have a feast uh, featuring uh, the relative. <laughs> uh, he said, no way. Am I going to do that? And he said his uncle was the one that uh, 
uh, you know, trained him uh, up to the, that point. And then he realized w- what it was. He didn't even realize it was for a skinwalker uh, society. And so when he found out, um, he, he just, you know, said no and, and, and was able to stay away from them. He, he left the state and everything. And, um, he, um, he, he used to work for the uh, film company I worked with. And so we convinced him to do a, a ritual, a cleansing uh, type, uh, magical, uh, ritual. And, and we, and, and we would film it and he named his uncle out loud. Now, according to skinwalker lore, if a skinwalker is publicly named, they will die within 24 hours. And he came in two days later with his uncle's obituary, uh, which was very impressive to me. <laughs> Chris, if I could just jump in for a minute sure. to say that um, uh, our friends, um, Jonathan and Stan, both Navajo Rangers, and that is not something that you just get by asking for it. Uh-huh. Um, they're both, uh, Jonathan, of course, now retired. You know, Stanley's still active. Two of the most ethical, grounded, decent people. I love both of those guys. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's important people know to back up that there are real people that are confirming this whose word has never been questioned. They, they're as respected yeah. universally by anybody that has followed their work in law enforcement on the res. And then the fact that they've been allowed to come forward and talk yes. about these very Correct. taboo Correct. subjects. You bet. I, I, I was doing research for my Stalking the Tricksters book, and I wanted to do a little section on skinwalkers. And I noticed at the Cameron Trading Post Gallery, there were two Kachina dolls about a foot tall, and they were of skinwalkers, mm. which I didn't even think that those existed. And so I never heard of them. Yeah, they're very rare. And cool. so I, I asked the, the, the kid that was working in there, I said, um, uh, you know, those two, uh, those two uh, kachinas you have in the back uh, of the Yisha Doloshis. And before I could even ask him who the artist was so I could take pictures and get permission, he ran. He, t- he literally ran out of the gallery. And uh, <laughs> I, f- I found out later from his boss that he quit. And they, they, he asked him, well, why are you quitting? And he goes, a skinwalker came in and asked me about those two. Kachina dolls. So he thought I was a skinwalker. <laughs> <laughs> you don't use you don't use the Dene term for him. Believe me. Oh my God, he he. <laughs> I freaked him out. It's the most t- taboo subject by by far on the res. Um, that and and probably incest or something uh, are the most taboo subjects. Uh, they're really the Navajo are so paranoid of of these uh, supposed witches. And I do think that there are some with the, with the real able to trans uh, shape shift. Um, I, I do have a sense that, that some of the ancient knowledge is still there, but very few of them are around now. And, and uh, the ones that claim they're skinwalkers are like, you know, the posers that they're trying to get money from people to, to freak out their, you know, the people they want to, you know, do harm to and stuff. And I, I think that they pa- pass themselves off as skinwalkers. But I'll tell you, you go to the Lukachukas or you go to the Chuska Mountains uh, there on the Triple Six Highway going up uh, from Gallup to Farmington and then off to the th- two-thirds of the way up, off to the to the east, you'll see those mountains there. You go tramping around there for a couple, three weeks, and uh, you'll run into some very interesting people that live in caves up there. And... Uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, hmm. don't say I didn't warn you. <laughs> no, no, that's the kind of stuff. My mom, uh, my my birth mother, used to be a a, a ranger, and she uh, uh, she did a bunch of work up there. She was a yeah. anthropologist too. I, I didn't know uh, her back then, but she yeah, she that she was really into that stuff. Tells me all kinds of stories. That's where she's from. So that's cool. I'm gonna have to go out there now. That sure. that is incredible. Yeah. Uh, one one last question about that, and then we're going to go to those super chats, folks. Yeah, uh, Gary, you you remember uh, when we did our our episode on the Skinwalkers, the yes. tale by the native policeman who who swore that he was driving along one night and came across two dogs standing on two legs in trench coats yeah. smoking. Yeah, I think that was uh, either John or Stanley, actually. So that was so you know them. Yeah, yeah. 
and and they are people of impeccable integrity. Yeah, absolutely. Smoking, I mean, Stan, isn't, smoking isn't good for the dog's health. I would really, yeah. no. really isn't. They, they they saw the same thing up at the uh, up at the Skinwalker Ranch, supposedly two uh, dog men leaning up against the tree smoking cigarettes. Oh my God, this is that is something that even yeah. you know. That I was like, well, this makes a good story, but no, and, and here you are no. from the horse's mouth, like one yeah. removed, telling yeah. us, Gary, that yeah. this is true. Is this one of the yeah. best conversations we've ever had in our lives? Yes, life? this this is great. I'm loving this. Well, I, uh, I lived in that area for 27 years, so I've, you know, the the Four Corners area. I lived in Sedona for 14, and then the San Luis Valley for 13. Hmm. So amazing. Absolutely. And that, and that could have just been one of those. And listen, I, 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 I'm not doubting these gentlemen at all. That could have been one of those things, your brain trying to process something that it doesn't understand. So yeah. it comes off as dog smoking cigarettes instead of, I don't know, some tentacled right. Cthulhu be, being right. standing there or something, no. you know, if, you, you, if, read you, my if mind. you had any idea how much weird ass stuff those guys have seen, it's, it's, it's pretty matter of fact, the way they talk. About really? It. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's not a bit, not really a big deal to them at all. They got over, they got over it a long time ago. Um, they're they're Navajo Rangers. They're like, uh, um, they take care of poachers, uh, people trespassing in the sacred sites. Yeah. Um, they're they're like a forest, a, a cross between a forest ranger, uh, a park service worker, and um, an investigator. Law uh, enforcement. Law enforcement, but but they're armed and they, you know, they're yeah. they're law enforcement. They're not like Navajo police. Uh, they're more of like a a uh, Navajo police are 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 you know uh, put in barracks around towns. They have the whole res as their jurisdiction. That that is incredible, amazing. Uh, al along the lines of this, uh, we have a super chat from RR nineteen dollars and ninety nine cents. Thank you, RR. It says fantastic speakers. I was wondering what either of the speakers thought are on the idea of the sightings of aliens and the paranormal beings uh, being the same phenomenon of entities that inspired the creatures of mythology. That's a pretty good question. Anyone mm -hmm. want to speak up to that? Yeah, um, I think it's very likely. But again, it's all speculative. We just mm -hmm. don't know. Um, but it makes perfect sense to me. This is not a time-sensitive issue. Anybody that studies um, the modern UFO phenomena kicking in officially from 1947 on would be naive to think that that's when it began per se. For whatever reasons we can only make educated guesses at, that's when it really manifested itself in uh an entirely different manner, but so many ancient traditions, so many beings that are associated with mythology, folklore in so many different cultures may or may not be derived from sightings of these other intelligences and interpretations about them. Uh, the well, same, that, the same with aerial objects. And uh -huh. uh, I, I think if, you, if you're really interested in that subject, uh, Jacques Vallée's uh, probably his finest work uh, was written in 1969 called uh, Passport to Magonia. Yeah. And what he does is he looks at the uh, the Celtic countries uh, primarily and looks at the, the elves and the fairies and the gnomes and the trolls and then equates them, uh, overlays those medieval or ancient okay. traditions onto the modern traditions of aliens and um, you know, other worldly beings and shows how there's seems to be some sort of, uh, of, of, of curve, a similarity uh, in reports that they're just couched uh, in the technology of the times. So Passport to Magonia, I recommend it highly. That's a very good point. Uh, Basil the Pump and Seagull uh, has a, a follow-up question for you guys. He says, guys, do you think the UFO phenomenon and the concepts in Christianity about angels and demons are they related? It seems that these entities are purposely obfuscating themselves to create confusion. That's a kind of a meme that runs through ufology, for want of a better term. Uh, any opinion on that? Uh, sure. Um, <laughs> yes, maybe. Uh, I, you know, uh, one of the answers that I find myself um, giving more often, well, uh, fairly regularly, unlike a lot of folks I know, is I don't know or I'm not sure, or I don't know enough about that hyper-specific question 
to have an informed opinion on it. And if I don't have an informed opinion, I often don't have an opinion. And that's fine with me. It frustrates other people. It makes <laughs> no. sense, though, Fair. that that would be the case no. in certain circumstances. Yeah. Now, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Loquacious Primate has a couple of super chats here, a 10 and a $2 one. Thank you. And thank you, Basil, for the other one. Uh, Loquacious Primate asks Peter and Chris, do you think that other intelligences, e extraterrestrial or not, have consciousness structurally close enough to us to establish communication? Have they shown interest slash effectiveness in initiating it? If so, what is some of the best evidence for it? Well, I think, uh, Christopher, your tale of the, you know, lying down and the lights zooming in and out and flashing uh, is indication of communication. But what do you guys think about that? Are they structurally close enough to us uh, that we can actually communicate with them? Purely well, theoretical. Yeah, we don't know. Some we of them. Um, yeah. I, well, there's clearly evidence of some communication. Yes, of course. Um, but uh, let's look at it from the other end of the telescope. It's generally accepted that human beings are the most evolved form of life ever by those people with that rather conventional point of view. If so, or at least in our own little domain here, um, we are basically uh, interacting with creatures, one could say are not as evolved as us, others would say more evolved, um, smaller mammals. Um, uh, let's just say that I'm a, uh, a research biologist along with Chris and we're a specialist in otters. We love otters. We've just been airdropped into the Hudson's Bay part of Canada. We're going to be picked up in six weeks. We've got all our supplies. We're doing a study on an endangered kind of otter. We set our uh, um, um, cages, traps that will not harm them. And one poor schnook otter walks into it. <laughs> The, the door falls, we come, we carefully take it out. Chris picks it up, he's petting it. It's panicked, of course. He's saying, we love you, we will not hurt you in a very soothing human tone of voice. Meanwhile, I'm giving an injection, spray painting a number on its side and putting in a radio collar around its neck. The otter wanders back into otter land and the other otters say, what the hell happened to you? He's never gonna believe this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we we're already doing it on a certain level. There are so many yeah. abduction accounts with yeah. usually archetypical gray type beings where they go through the motions. We love you. We will not harm you. You're special. We've seen you before. We'll see you again. Yeah. Uh, the basics are there. Let's remember one thing. Um, I'm actually have never been deeply involved in the world of science fiction. People simply assume that, oh, you're into UFOs. Therefore, you must be a a Star Trek and a Star Wars and a this and that maniac. No, it's not true. I was lucky enough as a, a boy to be uh, given my dad's copy of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea when I was about seven years old, which was one of the great, most exciting breakthrough reading experiences of my life. I've read Wells. I, I've read the great modern um, uh, science fiction writers. But, you know, talking about being a scholar on the first year of Star Trek, doesn't get any better as far as I'm concerned. I lost interest on a certain level after the initial two-year series. Gene Roddenberry wasn't just a great science fiction writer, he was a true visionary. Mm -hmm. And one of the concepts that he put forward for the Federation when they're out in space contacting and making contact with other civilizations, most of them bipeds as it turns out, uh, often different colored skin, but we were used to that here on Earth, is never show your full deck. The prime directive, never allow the other intelligences, if they're not as evolved as you are, how evolved you are, because their dreams will die, to uh, quote a, a line of um, Carl Jung's in, in dealing with a, uh, a tribal elder, an African, years after the fact about what it was like the day that the British strolled in in the 1870s, it's too overwhelming. Um, if you if you are empathetic, which I think is a very evolved skill, and we need more empathetic people on Earth now more than ever. If you're patient, if you're sensitive, if you are a passionate student of anthropology, uh, a Margaret Mead type, 
you want to produce the result you're after, not to make a big impression. And so they may tailor their interactions with us to what they know that we can either assimilate mm -hmm. or tolerate and do the best with that that they can. I know that's kind of a long-winded answer to the question, but it's a great question. It really is a great question. And uh, I, I want to say, uh, Gary, uh, I, I hope that I hope that you guys someday will come back on the show and come on Gary's channel and talk about uh, ancient aliens and uh, and that kind of thing. Because Gary talks about himself as an amateur or a fan. Let me tell you something. Uh, I know. It. I get he is it. an expert on that stuff. He is an expert. I, I love the ancient civilizations and, and it's yes. Eric Von Daniken and, and in search of that got me into that. And uh, my mind has changed on that like six well, times over the last 10 years. You and I are very connected on that years before I got involved in UFO studies and hadn't traveled. I, you know, again, thought I was pretty sophisticated because I was born in New York city and lived there most of my life. But again, grew up in a very small village nearby. Um, and started studying about ancient civilizations. It it absolutely took me over. It allowed me to dream bigger. And in a way, I'm luckier than you guys because at the height of the Vietnam War, I, after five uh, deferments, like our esteemed president and former uh, Vice President Cheney, I don't think they were looking for their deferments for the same reason I was, but I failed my physical. and. It was one of the most, the greatest reliefs of my life. But I also knew I needed a, a, a coming of age experience. And for a lot of young men and young women now for millennia, it's been the military. I'm not going to go into the details right now, but I ended up as um, a deckhand on a Norwegian freighter working my way to Europe and then just started to drift east. I had no idea of what I was going to do, but I visited a lot of those ancient civilizations and spent months walking around India. Uh, I visited Afghanistan twice, Pakistan, India, Nepal, um, Turkey, Greece uh, for a year. I was just on my own and the dollar was king then and I could do it on a few thousand dollars. I mean, it's gone forever now. It changed me for the better forever. It helped make me get the grounding for the person that I became, uh, somebody who sees themselves as a citizen of the world, who will travel at the drop of a hat, who has engineered kind of a, a life for myself that's very financially insecure. But guess what? I get to go to Knoxville, Tennessee next month. I mean, you know, uh, more exotic places, less exotic places too. I get to, to go to New Jersey in April. Um, very exotic. But that, that adventure spirit of traveling, I think, is one of the greatest things that we can aspire to. It makes you ferocious for knowledge. It makes you connect with people that you would never know otherwise. And again, um, Gary, in many cases, it can feed your thirst for information about the past by bringing you in contact with something from them. Coming back from um, the Exeter, New Hampshire UFO Festival and Conference last September um, with Bob and Jennifer, by the way, who are both speakers. Jennifer said, let's stop for half a day at a location I've been to. You guys have heard about it. And it's called um, New England Stonehenge or the American Stonehenge. I figured, what the hell? I mean, I, I've seen, you know, earlier settlement ruins in New England of uh, penetrations by um, people who aren't recorded in our history as such, but I was blown away. Um, I've spent, I've been to the UK probably 20 or 25 times. Um, I've revisited ancient standing stones. I, I spent a summer uh, tucked in under the Arctic Circle in the Orkney Islands, the largest concentration of Neolithic digs outside of um, um, uh, uh, the Avebury area and um, uh, I I was quite electrified. I had not seen anything like this since I had visited um, the Orkney Islands and the uh, wonderful ancient settlement that had been covered thousands of years before in a storm. And then I think in the 30s started to uh, um, accidentally uncovered. And it was like 
stepping into a time machine. For me, time travel is real in those ways. Yep. I think, you know, the technology, people love to hope it's real. And, you know, we have a lot of stuff that I'm not even going to comment on about, you know, the secret space program. And after your 20 years on Mars, you're, you know, regress back to that age so you can return to Earth. It is such, can I, I was going to say, can I say the word? Uh, yeah, please. It is such bullshit yeah. as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just actually well, yeah. really Say it alone, me. a little ducky. <laughs> yep. I, again, we're off on a tangent here that we can do another show. No, no, no. I know. I, I, it's refreshing but, to hear. Um, in fact, um, my um, uh, I, I just can't encourage young people enough to be bitten by this bug. It yep. will drive your intellect. It will um, it will make you a person who listens more, who experiences more, who enjoys more. Uh, and this is one of the ways in, um, a fascination with ancient civilizations or some of the more esoteric stuff that individuals like Chris and I deal, deal with. with bigotry, bigotry and prejudice. Yeah. <laughs> Travel. Yes. That's Travel. that's exactly Travel. it. Yep. I am connected to people all over yeah. the world, even if Me it's too. just in my memories. Um, a, a a fully armed tribal guy who I came upon roaming around in the hills outside of Kandahar, Afghanistan, just because I was bored that afternoon, who, you know, no language, little Farsi, little Pashto, a little English, a lot of gestures, come with me. Most people might not do that. <laughs> <laughs> I had a great afternoon um, without the use of language, um, having lunch with him in his very, very simple home. And when it was all over, it was uh, Salam Aleichem, Aleichem Salam, I wish you well and I'll never see you again. Uh, but taking rational risks. Uh, a lot of people feel very unsafe in today's world, and that's certainly natural enough. Um, since 9-11, and I'm a New Yorker, I was not far away when it happened. I remember the area before they built the trade centers. Um, I had friends in the buildings. Thank God they got out. But um, that just took me off on a tangent. Um, that That's perfectly okay. That's part of traveling is rambling and yeah. uh, letting you go where your well, feet will carry you. That's just Historically it. as well as realistically. There are people that I met and interfaced with who are incredibly kind to, you know, basically a kid with a pack on his back from America who knew shit about shingles and who took me into their homes, who fed me uh, in Iran, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in India, in Nepal, who I will never forget. And it's, I guess, before I ramble off on more onto this tangent, please remember everybody, especially at the loaded moment we are in history right now, the governments of countries do not necessarily represent the good people who live there, who are no happy with their governments than many of us are, uh, or for some cases, of course, happy. Um, but never disassociate yourself from the human race or another individual with different language, different color skin, different religion. Muslims are not Muslim extremists. Muslim extremists are Muslim extremists. The same way Christians are not Christian extremists. Jewish extremists. Take your pick. Uh, never generalize. Judge people on their own. And keep an open mind in the paranormal as well as the normal. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Gary and I have both uh, encountered this kind of thing uh, in, in our line of work. Uh, we get labeled falsely with uh, certain, you know, uh, tarred and feathered, really, uh, by by people who disagree with our views on pop culture, of all things, for God's sake. Right. <laughs> uh, which is which is really nuts, but you know. Yeah. The, the, this live streaming thing we're doing right here, which is, I mean, it's been around for a while, but if you look in the chat, we have people from all over the world, and and it's just what you're talking about. This is individuals. We're just connecting over a share you know, shared. Some knowledge. of them building friendships. Some of them actually may, who may meet in the future, and if they don't, yeah. the friendships are just as real. Yep. Uh, absolutely. That's very well said, sir. It's uh, one of the best things about the internet and social networking, which has a lot of downsides, but even sure does. this exchange right now, it's great to see my friend Chris again. It's been too long. Uh, 
be, well, make, I'm in New start. York now. <laughs> I know where exactly. I'm, well, I'm right down the right down the the road from uh, from Richard. I'm in uh, Chemung, which is oh, for gosh uh, sakes, forty miles uh, west. Of we got to get together, man. Um, yeah, I haven't been down to the city yet. I've been putting it off. No, no, I, I'm <laughs> actually in. I'm I'm in the woods outside of Ithaca right now. Oh, you're kidding! No, oh no, I'm around the corner, <laughs> oh, my, relatively oh, my speaking. My God, you're, you're 45 minutes away. Yeah, yeah. We have done it. Uh, we've yeah, okay. done a great exactly. job here. We were oh, united, united with folks. I, I thought you were still down in. Uh, in the I city. wish. I mean, I I love where I am, but I'm a New Yorker. If I had the money, I'd still be there. The Realtors yeah. one with oh. me years ago. I can't afford to live there, but I'm back very regularly and back in a couple of weeks. Yeah. and looking yeah, forward yeah. to it. Yeah, that I know. If I get down there, if I don't see <laughs> this group of friends, but I'm actually in Rochester and Syracuse. Pretty regularly, irregularly, and you know, oh, um, again, I'd love to go up me, and see Richard and Tracy. I have, oh I yeah, have, I have a, a standing invitation to go say hello. Absolutely, yeah, great I'd home. Too. Yeah. yeah, all in. Never been to Rochester. Never been to Syracuse. I love it. Well, that yeah. that is awesome, you guys. I, I'm I'm proud to have had some small role in. Uh, yeah, along with yeah. Gary of, of uh, this reuni reuniting, uh, and, and I've got some folks here that want to say uh, to you, uh, Stellar Heather says, uh, thank you, Mr. Robbins and O'Brien for being on. I'm skeptical about this kind of stuff unless my eyes see it, but I love the topic and your stories. I want to believe, which is, you know, a very <laughs> open way to, to put it. Now, Illuminati has a message for you, Christopher. Uh, he says, hail Exozone, your guest and I, meaning you, Christopher, have something in common. We've both traveled the mycelial network, which, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, Star Trek Discovery, is one of the worst things uh, in history. And Gary, yes, <laughs> we, we know that you have uh, as well, my friend. I, I never have. I, well, I've eaten mushrooms on pizza, but that's about it. Mm. Well, I, I grew up in Washington State, and uh, <laughs> I'm I'm responsible for bringing Cubensis mexicalis <laughs> spores, importing them into the Pacific Northwest. So, yay! That was you, <laughs> no? Yeah. <laughs> in high school, I spent probably as much time, if not more, on mushrooms than I did. Uh, I did normal. I, I lived on a horse ranch with 30 head of cattle. In, <laughs> in a in a rainforest, okay. I rest my what case. You do? <laughs> yep. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't have to go to work. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> that is outstanding. Yeah, yeah. Again, I don't. I don't uh, say it's for everybody, but it sure worked for me. <laughs> well, I'd like to try it someday, but I, I never yeah. have. I have no shadowy underground uh, connections yeah. that can <laughs> fix me up with this kind of thing down at the docks. You know what I mean? But yeah. I want it. I, I really do. Uh, Bionic Belly Button, who is one of our wrenches on this channel, hail Bionic Belly Button, says, welcome Peter and Christopher. Thank you for being here today. Can you tell us your favorite or most personally significant case or incident to date? I think you both have. Isn't it the ones that started you on Pretty your path? Pretty much, yeah. Something yeah. Else? Well, I, I, this for was, was not fun for me. It was not something I chose as much as looked up at the wrong moment or for some would say the right moment. Favorite? I, I'm i going to have to give that some thought. Yeah, yeah that's... That's a tough one. Uh, the one that I, I find most intriguing, besides my own uh, personal uh, initial experience, I, I've had uh, I had as many five sightings in one day in the valley when things are really popping. Oh. So I've seen I've seen a lot of different things uh, and video, got to videotape a few. Um, but the NORAD event that happened in January '95, when the uh, when NORAD, you know, called. Uh, the Rio Grande County Sheriff to report yes. a few acre-sized fire uh, in the on the hillside there in the mountains surrounding the the valley yeah. and and it turns out that there was a, a, a retired Strategic Air Command pilot fighter pilot who saw a whole squadron of UFOs descend into the area. Um, that was a dark horse uh, case and I think in the whole entire year of '95 and some of the things that happened around that case. Uh, including a flurry of Bigfoot sightings the week before, uh, a whole bunch of UFO sightings, weird military activity, um, that and, and deaths at NORAD. <laughs> uh, that, that case was, was really intriguing. <laughs> I, I would say, as far as I'm concerned, um, Bonnie asked me that question when I'm back on the show, huh? All right. Thank you. So that means he's coming back, folks. Yay! They're coming back. <laughs> That's, That's outstanding. Awesome. 
Uh, Lady Mist has a question for you guys. Uh, thank you for the super chat, Lady Mist. Says, to your guests, uh, was wondering if you ever heard of siblings around the age of seven to eight years, all experiencing seeing people within an intense blue light over the course of several evenings. That's very specific. It is very specific. No, but I have yeah. experienced similar. I, I have uh, similar accounts. And um, the event that I began by discussing, the sighting that my sister and I had, there's also a blue light aspect to it that we both mentioned. Again, um, I, I want to do justice to anything that I say, and I'm uh, I see our time is starting to slip away. At least mine is, um, so I'll hold that also. But it's a great hyper specific question. Yeah, well, it doesn't doesn't ring any bells for me either. Um, not siblings. I've had individuals. Uh, in fact, a friend of mine uh, in Michigan. Uh, over a couple, three nights, I think she uh, she had uh, something similar to what you described, but she was, you know, a mature lady at that point in her, you know, mid to late twenties, and uh, there were no siblings involved. So, very interesting. Uh, Mexican Iron Man again. Uh, he says, "Great show. Uh, thank you, Mexican Iron Man." And he also, with another super chat, very generous of you, my friend, says. What heat and resistance, if any, did uh, Mr. Robbins face in the writing and release of the real Forrestal story? Uh, I always thought it sounded covered up. Did you have any kind of uh, discouragement in telling this story? No. And I, um, I'm familiar with people who will put themselves on the spot to research uh, controversial subjects and then sometimes say I was threatened or I was given special information. Uh, I've been connected with a higher power or you know somebody tried to shut me up. I think sometimes it's specious. It's a way to feel cooler or look more exotic. No, I, I was left alone basically in part because it never dominated and because I never incorporated sensationalist details into it. Also, it's a, uh, I mean, it's a very important story. And if I'm accurate, then the first secretary of defense was murdered. And part of the reason was because he had a profound breakdown. He understood it better than anybody. Like a good Roman soldier, he tried to throw himself on his sword. He knew that he, as far as 1949, Nobody knew anybody who was seeing a therapist and a nervous breakdown, please. That's for girls and sissies. The most alpha male in America wasn't going to have a nervous breakdown. And if he did, and in this case, it was undeniable, it manifested itself within minutes of stepping down and having the second secretary take over. It happened in the White House and the people closest to Truman, protective of the early days of we can't let this information out. It took me many years to get to the point where I could try to get behind their eyes and begin to forgive them in a way for doing what they thought was right. Namely, if this man recovered and then had a relapse, who knows what he might say. Allegorically, at least he knew where all the bodies were buried. He knew everything that the president knew about UFOs. For me, the mantra comes down to the mob idea uh, before the hitman gives you two in the back of the head with the silence 22. It's nothing personal, it's just business. James Forrestal had to die to cover the insecurity of the men closest to Truman who felt understandably that if things went haywire, he represented the greatest security risk in the history of the Western world and nothing less. Um, but no, I was allowed to do my work and um, I would expect in a way the worst thing that could happen now as I become more associated with Forrestal by more people as opposed to associated with them by the core of people, the hundreds or the few thousand that I'm aware of my work over the years in it. The last thing the forces that be would want was anything inopportune to happen to me. 
send me vitamins. You want me to be alive? You don't want, you know, if I had a heart attack right now as um, a plane crashed into the house, as my cat who was rabid bit me, as I had a, uh, you know, a brain tumor, as a hunter's shot inadvertently came through the window, died a completely natural explainable death. A lot of people I know and a lot of people I don't know would jump to the conclusion that somebody tried to shut me up and with good cause. <laughs> <laughs> Same for Chris, you know. Um, people like us, if you bring attention to us, that only exacerbates the interest. And yeah. hmm, what's, what's really going on here as opposed to nothing to see here, folks. Move yeah, on. Yeah. The mysteries and the aliens don't bother me at all. Uh, the people scare me. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> the only time I've had any problems is when I was sticking my nose in where people didn't want me to uh, to stick my nose. That's another story. I've had that experience, too. Yeah. And speaking of sticking your nose where it doesn't belong, I just want to give uh, go ahead and establish my geek cred, Christopher, and say that the Star Trek episode you were referencing earlier was Wink of an Eye. Uh, the aliens right. were the Scalosians, and uh, they were moving faster than the eye could see because of uh, water, uh, the Scalos uh, water. I, I know go. my stuff. I know you my stuff. Live long and uh, prosper with me. Rest. 110 percent uh we we love star trek here uh all of us gary and, and i both uh do uh nicholas horton wanted to ask uh what are the chances of an actual first contact with alien life forms happening in real life outside of fiction it happens every day it's just that it doesn't happen in the proverbial landing on the white house lawn they know better. and if it, 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 exactly i was gonna say don't don't ask, don't think that someone's going to come here and ask to you know take me to your leader anytime uh, soon. Uh, In that sense, <laughs> along with um, people actively trying to educate other people both here and abroad on the seriousness and reality and implications of truly anomalous UFO foot and related yeah. phenomena, disclosure is a simple process that's unwinding. However, not in a theatrical way. Um, when St Steve Bassett, who I consider a dear friend and one of the most dedicated people I've ever met on any subject, who's probably done more to advance other people becoming passionate about encouraging other people to become passionate. We had a discussion early on when he became involved in disclosure work, which was you live talking to me through the Vietnam protest era, and that's sure enough true. I was out in the streets with a lot of young guys that had no intention of being sent into a bogus war. Not that I have nothing but respect for the people who did serve, but I know I saved at least one life, and I've tried to do my best to be a contributing member of society ever since. But how can we get together a Vietnam-style protest movement that expands geometrically as opposed to arithmetically. And I said in so many words after thinking about it, it's not going to happen unless they reveal themselves or unless the United States government, and it ain't going to happen, folks, becomes fully forthcoming and lets out at least some of what they have. Their yeah. hand may be forced or they may be the ones to just say enough already. You've had your hundred years and here we are, you know, get used to it um well i'll tell you every once... day make no mistake about it every day more people let me put it this way doing what chris and i do um every day more and more people care less and less about what other people think about what they think about this subject that was not the case 10 years ago millennials 30 somethings and down they know the government's covering it up they're brought up in a culture where, yeah, of course, we're not alone in the universe one way or the other. But you have to understand, yeah. I'm busy worrying about my future and overwhelmed with technical and um, uh, high tech distractions and entertainments and, you know, just trying to live in the digital world. The other group are those folks who are retired or older people who have some discretionary spending are starting to go to the conferences, talk about this stuff with their friends where they would have never done it earlier. It's happening. People who have sightings, like you guys, all of us, um, if it's with one person, two person, seven people, it is expanding every day, but geometrically. 
um, I, I mean, arithmetically, it's not expanding into the hundreds of thousands of millions overnight. And at least to leave off on a note relative disclosure, I get the passion of enough, we're ready, give it to us. We've been waiting for years, all well and good. However, those people, the four of us are good examples. We're open-minded enough. We have enough um, ability to consider what other people consider is impossible, that if official announcements were made, we could tolerate it. We could um, grasp it. In fact, we would be kind of anchors, many of us in our little communities and circles of friends. Oh my God, I've always laughed at you behind your life. You know, you're back. You know, I love you, but you're my goofy friend that's into UFOs. We're having a problem over here. Can you come over this week and have dinner with my kids? Because they're freaking out. The world at large is not us. The overwhelming number of people in society here and abroad are not ready for this, hmm. really. Well, and so we have to be patient and understanding. And I'll tell you when disclosure is going to happen. Uh, Jim, uh, James Fox. Um, I helped him put his movie to bed and, yeah. uh, and I got a chance. To, uh, he brought me in as his last, his last sort of, you know, filter, his last uh, test, hmm. you know, person in the field. Tell me what you think. What do I got to do to tweak this thing? What do you think? Yeah. And I'll tell you, this film is going to be in a thousand theaters. That's it. Okay. It's the people, 95% theater. of the people that are going to see that film are going to have a, a passing interest in this subject with no knowledge, no yep. knowledge. And when they walk out of that theater, they just be... had disclosure. <clears throat> so you know, you're on, absolutely the, right. The, ground, the groundswell on this is, <coughs> is going to be breathtaking. I have heard about, yeah, actually, yep. uh, Dolan's going to be talking to him today. Yep. Uh, James is... Fact. I've it's been talking our, to him every day for the past three months. You have? <laughs> oh, I'm glad that you're involved. I'm very happy to hear that you're involved. He, he flew me out there three times. To James uh, has been polishing his craft for years. He's a fine filmmaker. Yeah, he also fun. happens to be one of the kindest, most thoughtful, oh, my God, yeah. decent people I have ever met in my life. His son I, I can't say so, enough superlatives about him. So he also lucky. happens to be a brilliant fucking documentary filmmaker yeah. he's the best, outstanding. The best, in, the best in the paranormal realm his That's life has sure. been leading up to this project and yeah. um chris is absolutely right this is going to be a transformative yeah. experience for people Huge. and one of the big differences and it seems like minuscule on a certain level if he released it as a dvd or it was available on gaia or um no. you know you could totally download different. it off the internet but well and good but that experience, no. being in a movie theater with other people, exposed to it at the same time, with a mixture of people in the audience yep. who are fairly well schooled on it and who, oh, gee, there's going to be a flying saucer movie. Let's go see it. I am absolutely riveted to, uh, well, uh, looking forward to watching what <laughs> unfolds in September. Um, yeah. Once we start to get audience reactions and that stuff starts to go absolutely viral the reactions and the way that that will start to steamroll um again i think that we will have a similar situation with um uh, randy nickerson's zimbabwe film i don't know the degree to which it's going to be able to be promoted the same or released but it's going to be that level yeah. quality work it's going to be a very interesting year in that sense god uh, well, this, this film is this film is is uh every bit as good as if not better than any documentary film I've ever seen on a big screen. And it's rare for a documentary film in oh, yeah. any genre to yeah. get a theatrical release, let alone it's incredibly about, rare about UFOs. And now, that was the, part of his goal from the start. The, the, theaters. People, the people that are in this, we're talking heavy hitting, you know, the assistant secretary, of defense for you know intelligence, uh, John Podesta, Clinton. I mean, there's some major names yeah. in this film. He's pulled and, it all together. He did, and it took him six and a half years. Yeah. He wow. he came he came within 
uh, less than 24 hours of losing his house, his cars, and his wife. <laughs> and his Randy, Randy very much had the same thing of putting his whole life on Hawk. Yeah. And he's worked on his film longer. Uh, I know. These are remarkably got. They're both just two of my Super favorite people for starters. But they're James brilliant an, filmatic artists, and they're going to help yeah. change American and then world culture. That That's Again. disclosure right yeah. there. There you go. Yep. So the film's called uh, The Phenomena. So yep. and it's coming Correct. out September 2020, and uh, we, yeah, we'll we'll be talking about it a lot. Oh, and it yeah. does. No, I'm very because I was gonna kind of ask you. I've been seeing that you're starting to see the the buzz build up about this thing. Yeah. Well, the trailer, guys, yeah. the, tra trailer just came out today. Yeah. The trailer just came out today. So yeah. Oh. Uh, great well, it came out a, a couple of days ago, but it's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, and let's well, all help that Wednesday, trailer go viral. Wednesday. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. We'll be pumping this yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah really? um, the phenomenon film is dot com is the the, the website, um, and I I just can't, I mean sitting there and uh, you know, I mean helping him finish that with Jacques Vallée sitting next to me was that was a cool. really, I mean uh, that's one of those uh, I don't know uh, what do they call him uh, those those pinch me moments you know a guy that I've been reading his book since I was a little kid and. He's just such a hero of mine. And then, you know, to see how he was able to wrangle some of the most incredible science yeah. being exposed to the public for the first time. And without Valet, it wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Uh, there was uh, a bunch of things in this film without specific individuals who, who, because it was James, they were willing to go the extra mile and, and sit down and say things and show us things that normally they would not have. And this is, this is unprecedented. Uh, the, the, I mean, did you know, Peter, that there was footage of Jesse Marcel walking around the, uh, the debris field? I was no. through Stan. Yeah. Yeah. Are you kidding? I've never, I've never seen that before. I've never I've heard of that. Yeah. Did you know that 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 uh, presentation that they gave at the UN was filmed? Oh yeah. Oh, I know that. I know yeah, that. Well, I've never <laughs> seen the footage I before. Saw the cameras. So. <laughs> wow. Yeah, but, but have you ever seen the footage? <laughs> Valle has said yeah. he'd never even seen it. <laughs> wow. I have. I have official stills. You know, yeah, with the yeah. UN no, they got their, on the back. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they got the, one of me uh, in the only suit that I owned back then. And yeah. uh, looking very seventies, I might add. Yeah, yeah. Not well, in my seventies, but seventies. Yeah, it's. Uh, <laughs> he is an, a magical filmmaker, and uh, I mean, he went to China twice. He went to South America four times, and didn't even use a single frame. Uh, wow. So what, what we're going to do is we're we're putting. I'm helping him put together a ten part uh, mini series that's going to uh, utilize the two Brilliant. or three uh, or, or 17, I think he said, terabytes of footage. <laughs> that's perfect. I mean, yeah. that's the way to so, go. Yeah, and he exactly. will have the backing and the impetus after the tremendous oh, yeah. success. Of no, he's already, he's, uh, they're already fighting over it. <laughs> uh, guys, I have to tell you, I have to jump now, but yeah. um, I yeah, will me be too. glad to come back to the show. Chris, be in touch with you offline and see I, you sooner I, than later. Yeah, I would love to come up and say hi or have you come Yeah, I got a guest room, man. Mikasa oh, Sukasa. Cool. Thank you. I can't you, wait. You guys are fantastic. Uh, just uh, two two quick more questions. And then also I would love to send a shout out to Gil, who brought yes, us all together. Uh, exactly. Yep. Gil no, Beanie. I don't know if he wants his last name said or not. Do you guys know? Uh, I don't know. I I assume he does. We'll just say Gil. Gil, thank you, Gil. Gil. And thank you, Gil. Uh, you did a fantastic job. This is one of yeah. the best shows we have ever had, and I am yes. thrilled. Uh, uh, just a couple more, folks. John Oak Oakletree asks, "Why have governments throughout history discouraged investigation into the origin of human consciousness?" And Apex Tyrannus is asking, so if the government has spent years threatening and murdering people about UFOs, why are they now releasing videos and letting their people talk about UFOs, even encouraging pilots to come forward? Uh, any feedback on either of those questions? Maybe each of you could yeah. take yeah. Let me jump in quickly. Me, um, I spent a good part of my career focused on the nature of how ridicule functions and the tremendous power it has had to keep this an outsider subject. Um, in um, December 
2017, a pair of articles came out in the New York Times. There was actually another article several months before by one of our local New York State uh, UFO uh, statisticians um, that received some favorable um, feedback, but it wasn't until the article about the Tic Tac case, uh, the fact that um, uh, it, Speaker of the House um, from Utah. Uh, it was he was a, the head of the Senate. Well, the majority, think, majority, majority yeah, leader, majority the, leader. Harry Reid. Harry Reid um, had specifically asked for, I think, $22 million drop in the bucket and the big budget, but for funding a UFO-related investigative project. That and the fact that the article was well-written by uh, uh, Times writer Ralph Blumenthal and Leslie Keene, who, of course, has made great contributions to ufology as of the paranormal research, it kind of escaped control. And it's not like the government released the footage uh, with great happiness. No, Christopher um, Mellon. Like other footage has followed. Um, Christopher Mellon smuggled it out. Exactly. Exactly. Spent some time with him last year. Uh, the, the guys who have come forward are just what you'd imagine. Just they've been through the grinder. They've got nothing but integrity. Uh, they're very uh, uh, figures worthy of our respect. But it kind of formed a little BCAD in that ridicule in major media just kind of to back off. And it's doubly interesting to me because it's kind of an equal opportunity employer. It doesn't matter whether it's CNBC or Fox. Nobody's really the wink, wink, nudge, nudge. This is embarrassing, folks. I'm the newsreader. Flying saucer, UFO, roll the eyes, uh, you know, and aside to the weather person. That seems to be changing, although I keep waiting for the other shoe to drop. I think what's really happening here, um, uh, addressing it to the, the person that asked the question, is that it's starting to get out of control. And the best that the government, to use the euphemism, can do is manage it. And try, do to get their in, best. try to get in front of it. Yeah, exactly. So that they have control. And take, um, you know, as long as, you know, life's given us a lemon, let's make some lemonade and look like we're right. more open-minded. Well, another thing, Peter, another thing is that uh, uh, the, the truth embargo, as Stephen Bassett has dubbed it, yes. uh, really started in uh, with the Robertson panel in, 1950, yes. in, in right. 1951, I think. That's right. And, and since then, all the, the cold warriors, all the people that were really nervous – about the subject and the ones that remember when they were kids, uh, the Mercury Theater, Orson Welles broadcast <laughs> oh, and grew powerful. up with, with the, with the sci-fi movies, they're, they're gone. And now we have a whole new generation of yeah. people that are in positions of power. Uh, they're not as, uh, uh, you know, prejudiced against the subject. And we're slowly starting to see a sea change. Uh, pardon the pun there. Uh, yeah. see, see a sea change. Uh, in in the culture, and uh, it it I think Peter, you're right. The uh, the tic tac thing, although I do think that that is our own technology, and that uh, these guys they trotted it out just to see what the reaction would be. And I think the government's uh, going to stay ahead of the situation by claiming it's ours. Nee, 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 we fooled you guys. That's how they stay ahead of things. Yeah. It reminds they've let the cat out of the bag. Yeah, and yeah. now the subject is when the gray lady, when the New York Times puts that that subject uh, in a positive light yep. and then Tucker Carlson is on Fox News, yeah. uh, you, you know, Larry King uh, for years. Has sure. been he was a pioneer, the subject, a real pioneer. Sure. And uh, all these things are adding up to a perfect storm for a documentary film to hit the yep. movie theaters yep. worldwide. And it's just going to start a groundswell. I'm, I'm telling you, this, this film is disclosure. Chris, you've reminded me. I'm excited. Me, um, which is, uh, there was a great um, physicist named Max Planck. Uh, he is a Nobel Prize winner. And he had a wonderful quote. I think I've got it word for word, which is, science progresses one funeral at a time. Mm -mm. Right. That, <laughs> that is great. Yeah, exactly. The applications here are um, not difficult to draw. 
You guys have been absolutely fantastic. It has been an honor to meet you both, gentlemen. Uh, what a what a rare treat this has been. Uh, Christopher O'Brien, author of Stalking the Herd and many other books, uh, as well as this ufodap.com project. Uh, I have plugged bo uh, both of those in, in the chat uh, and will continue Thanks. to do so. Christopher, you've been fantastic. Thank you. And of course, Peter Robbins, uh, who has a James Forrestal documentary that is in release right now, but is coming out uh, soon for download DVD. I have also put that link uh, in the chat. Please support these gentlemen and, uh, and look at these projects. They're doing great work. Uh, it has been an absolute honor, both of you guys. Thank you so much for coming on the Exo Zone. And we were glad to. And I just want to close by thanking you guys for having us on. Um, thanking my no, old friend you. Gil for moving the uh, chess pieces around so it happened. Thanking your very involved audience. And just to say, uh, I will let you know when um, the uh, the documentary is available for download. Mm -hmm. Also, to just close by saying the book left at East Gate, which I spent nine years of my life co-writing uh, to the exclusion of everything else. I'm very proud of the fact that it was a, a major smash bestseller in the United Kingdom. There are hundreds of parts of that book that I am and will always be proud of. And if you read it, um, I hope you will note the hundreds of annotated fact check footnotes and different kinds of materials, my own experience, but read it understanding that because of my co-author, it is partly a fictional book, but um, yeah. I'm, I'm not disclaiming the book, just the parts of it that I was kind of hoodwinked on. Mm. Anyway, thank you all uh, yeah, for hearing so me much. out yeah. and see you around the campus. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Thank it's an honor gentlemen. and privilege to talk to you soon, I hope. And, and uh, maybe Gary will get the chance next time to talk about ancient civilizations uh that would that would blow his yep. mind <laughs> all right you guys take care christopher take care peter okay. thank you okay bye-bye you guys well gary whoa, whoa. What, what, what do you what do you think of that that was awesome that that, that was, was that was amazing and i have uh i have here apex tyrannus in the chat saying something that maybe we have breaking news that somehow got out here, Gary, about uh, Mellon smuggling out the UFO Nimitz video. Uh, is that, uh, do you think, is that? I don't know if that's ever, I, I didn't know that. I didn't uh, know that either. Um, uh, I mean, is this somehow, a, <laughs> is this well, like a it, it depends, okay, because the it depends on which. It, it might be because the UFO the Nimitz video has been out there, a version of it. Um, there was additional one, and of and sometimes it gets confused with the East Coast incident that happened 10 years later. But uh maybe it was he who did it. Ten, maybe Mellon was the one who did it 10 years ago. So yeah, that that might be uh you know. I mean, he did kind of work for him. So I, I guess, I don't know. I don't know. I accidentally walked out with a couple of things with Technicolor, but they technically <laughs> gave me permission afterwards. So I don't know. Um, yeah. that Apex Duranis claims no one has said that before. A A Apex would know too. So Apex awesome. Would know. Apex got is really smart. Uh, I, uh, wow. What a, what a conversation. Gil, Gary. Gil. Gil, you the man, dude. Gil, uh, you did a fantastic job. If you would like to come on and, and chat with us, I, yeah, I sent him on. the uh, invite, but he uh, he declined. Okay. Uh, although he didn't say anything, but he just, I I, I hope he got it. But um, anyway, uh, Gil, you're, you're welcome to come on. I consider you the producer of this segment. Uh, Gil really put it together. Yeah. Uh, he, I'm going to open invitation. Gil, if you want to go to... Uh... If you want to go to contact in the desert, you let me know. We'll get you there. We'll what get a, you there. What a great guy. And he has a guest uh, uh, lined up for you, Gary, uh, on your next show. And uh looks like maybe 
uh, these folks might come back and and uh, I just had to ask on your behalf about uh Oh, thanks, man. No. I just they, knew, you know. They were cool. They were totally cool. I mean, listen, this is our first interview, ladies and gentlemen, and uh I'm not very good at Doomcock's a pro, so he's made for this shit. Uh, and I, it was great. I was enjoying listening. I hope you were as well. This was the best exo zone ever. Uh, and we've had some good ones and, uh, yeah, that was, that was cool. And I am fired up about phenomenon, the phenomenon film. Oh God. The Thank way God that they got listen, me, the way that they were excited, like they were that, that put my hair on end because it's yeah. like, these, these guys have seen it all. They've been everywhere. And if, if they're saying that this thing is a game changer, it's a game changer. So they, they are. <laughs> and, and, and listen, I'm not, you know, they've done radio shows and stuff, but I'm not too sure if they're familiar with the, with a doomcock and nerd erotic live stream, which, you know, a four hour show is a short show. <laughs> I know so that was awesome that they sat through it. And yeah, they uh, did. And they seemed like they weren't like, being you know suffering it seemed like they were no. into it uh, and they, i'm i mean i i would have just let them keep talking uh it it was uh it was incredible it wow. was it really was uh and thank you all for man we had uh like a thousand people watching consistently the whole time it didn't even uh, over a thousand and like it didn't tick down very much it was really that's unusual so Thanks it, again. It, it, it was incredible. Uh, what I'm going to do, folks, is I'm going to cut out, you know, like, like download it and, and edit it and, and make it, you know, a manageable length interview and then put tags in it and, and uh, you know. Uh, but but for now, we're just going to go ahead and get these super chats and, and share with you guys. And thank you so much for all of your your patience. Uh, I was a little worried. Uh, I, did, I do not ever ignore you guys. Uh, during live streams. I mean, you are the show. Uh, this time it was just an experiment, a little bit different, having two, not just one, but two incredibly knowledgeable people of the, the, over the spectrum of what they don't like to call ufology, but uh, for what of, you know, <laughs> yeah, uh, it was incredible. I mean, holy crap, we could have done a whole show just on the opening stories that they, what, that, what I, I mean, like, I, yeah, what I liked about both of them is they're, they're freaking, uh, the the rebels within this a little bit they're not they're not sellouts and i'm not saying listen dolan's on those show show and uh, richard dolan is one of the most respectful mm -hmm. best voices in this field period um and and he could be on the shows and that's cool i understand it, it but um the the good side of the shows okay it, especially ancient aliens uh, which I, I started believing in the ancient aliens theory, but then I went to something else, but it was ancient aliens that got me thinking about it. And this, these, these shows that we got from, from uh, to the scars stars Academy, it split the community down, but a lot, listen, it's largely egos and Gaia and all this stuff. And, and yeah, Gaia, I'm not a fan of Gaia. I am not. And then they practically put on contact in the desert. I understand that they're everywhere. But uh, these shows do get this out in the consciousness. And what they were talking about later is we're just uh, towards the end of the live stream is we're getting uh, an, each generation. We're getting people who are more tolerant of this subject. And maybe in our lifetimes, uh, well, we're already seeing the acknowledgement. It's happening. Whether we believe it or not, you know, uh, that's debatable. But uh, if that Tic Tac, like I said, that Tic Tac, if it's if it's ours or theirs, it doesn't make it any less extraordinary how that thing moves. So if we've got technology like that, um, for uh, one, no, I, no, no country can touch us. Uh, well, that's the thing. I don't believe it. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, you know, if you had a, a thing like that, that was also armed, uh, we wouldn't be worried about North Korea and, you know, no. I mean, it just, it would Anything. be over. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, I certainly didn't want to, uh, you know, I mean, this was a getting to know you and exactly. And I, no, I wasn't everybody's gonna, got a right to their opinion. It, it, exactly. Uh, and and there's, is a, a well-informed opinion. Yeah. Um, but I would, I would question, you know, the logic of, uh, of that kind of thing. Yeah. I'm um, not sure. That's where I'm def definitively at is I don't know. I, I find it hard to believe that we would have something that could defy physics, but it, it, there exactly. might be. There might be. It might be. And of course, where did it come from then? Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. And and listen, and the stuff, the only thing I don't, I do know is we don't have people going to bases in Mars and then de-aging themselves and coming back to earth. That one, 
I would have to be on a lot of freaking peyote to believe that one, and I still wouldn't. So that's right. Plus, Mars, the atmosphere is burning, has been it's for on 14 fire. years, right? It's on fire. Uh, <laughs> fire, fire. Oh my Jesus. God, dude. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, my the chat was so funny last night on my live stream for that. <laughs> God <laughs> damn it. it this, the chat was so much better than me, uh, but it was uh, CSI Picard, everybody. But no, we're here to talk about ufology. We'll, we'll do that. We, we, we're, we're, we're talking about ufology. I've yeah. got some super chats here. Bird of Prey 5 with a $2 super chat. Thank you, Bird of Prey 5 says, finally, the return of Exozone. Come yes. Oh, come on. We came back in a big way, Gary came back in a big way we did and kapla bird of prey five and uh hey take care of your boy uh anti trekker i'm getting a little worried about him absolutely uh love you anti trekker uh but uh yeah uh basil the pump and seagull eh, eh, with a five dollar canadian super chat hail basil says for this live stream open a new window and search for x files major key in my opinion should be the exozone three theme X Files when the aliens come down to hug you. Uh yes, Basil. I have I have heard that. Unfortunately, uh, you know, it exists and it's uh someone else's music, so can't really use it. But uh it is good and and I agree with you. It it's a it's a fantastic piece of music for the XO Zone. Thank you, Basil, the pump and seagull, eh! Sam Whiskey with two super chats in a row, a $9.99 one and a $4.99 super chat. Thank you for both of those, Sam Whiskey, who says, Hail Doomcock and Nerdrotic. I got drunk and sent the Inquisition an incoherent super chat. It was not my fault. <laughs> it was not my fault. I saw <laughs> Doctor Who and I got very upset. I guess you could say I got cataloged. Uh, poor, poor guy. I, we know. We it's know. all uh, don't worry about it we get those all the time and i uh, i got, poor doomcock he gets messages from me i am the worst i can't uh, spell <laughs> anything i don't bother correcting my spelling i just i'll yeah. you know I, and i type with one hand so he gets like gobbledygook that says banana <laughs> face moonshot or something and, he, and doomcock just rolls with it he's all i know i i, I it's a, yeah <laughs> well gary's exaggerating entirely he's he's completely lucid and uh and, and <laughs> knows more than he than he says but uh we're on the same wavelength so even if he makes a mistake <laughs> i just know what he means and i don't even notice there you uh, go <laughs> and, and sam whiskey also says hey dc and gary what franchise do you think michigan j abrams will destroy next dc dc yeah, uh, he's good. Just, freaking Justice League Dark. Uh, he's like the single worst human being in the world to, to direct that movie. Uh, Justice League Dark should be directed by uh, Guillermo del Toro, although he'll never, he'll quit the project. But that's, yeah, no. I, I, no J.J. Abrams is not a horror director. Um, if J.J. Abrams directed something, no, he's not good. I was about to say he'd be good if somebody wrote it, but no, he's just not good. Uh, JJ Abrams is not a horror director. He's a horror director. Oh, <laughs> man, that was a layup for you right there. Yes, I, was, I hey, know. Thank you. Well thank taken, you for, sir. Throw me a softball. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Uh, this was this was kind of kind of tough. I mean, uh, trying to juggle everything, and I I sure wanted to make sure that you had a chance to say anything you wanted to say, buddy. And uh, uh, when it's on your channel, uh, you know, please do the same. Uh, you know, I, uh, I, I hope that, uh, you had fun and uh, I had it was a blast. Absolute awesome. blast. Um, as far as next week is concerned, folks, it's up in the air because, um, uh, I've got, uh, uh, some stuff going on with, with mom Roddick. Okay. So that's why my, I haven't been putting out a ton of videos and my live streams got canceled this week. Um, I, I have just been dealing yeah. with some stuff uh it'll be dealt with in a week or so but next week i'm gonna we're gonna try to make it happen uh because we we started out so great i i now i kind of have to make sure it happens but i'll keep you all posted keep it on twitter sorry to interrupt doomcock but yeah keep it on oh, the community no. section and i'll let you all know but following week for sure this thing is on it's 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 going so we're we're gonna make it happen uh even if we have to shift the times around or something we'll 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 figure yeah. out a way but exozone is back and uh uh crimson taint with a twenty dollar and 99 cent canadian super chat thank you crimson taint uh, is echoing what we're saying exozone is back at last 
Hail Doomcock, hail guests, and hail everyone in the chat. Thank you, Crimson Taint, very, very much. Uh, you guys are the best. You guys adapted to this uh, this this difficult, uh, you know, offbeat format, and uh, I'm encouraged. I think we should uh, definitely do it again. Uh, and uh, RR with a forty nine dollar and ninety nine cent super chat. Thank you, RR, very much for that generosity, my friend. Says, hail the return of the Exozone to unlock the door to this land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas you must use the key of your imagination. For those willing to question reality, prepare to cross over into the exozone. Thank you both. Wow, what a wonderful yeah. super chat, RR. I love the way you phrase that. I did kind of my best... Uh, Rod Serling, it's it's not uh, it's not great, but uh, I I try. And thank you, man. Thank you for being here. Thank you for that question earlier. Uh, thank you all for your support. This has been a, 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 oh, amazing. Uh, <laughs> kind of almost makes up for Star Trek Picard, uh, which I watched this morning. And fuck me, God Almighty! Oh, I'm never staying up late to watch that again. Oh no, man, was it was awful. <laughs> awful dude it's just better gee i don't even oh god it was bad yeah. uh dilbertson hail dilbertson with a 10 pound super chat from the uk my good friend dilbertson hail to you sir he says hail doomcock and nerdrotic salute the mods and greetings to the best chat on youtube finally i can once again rejoice as the exo zone returns curses to harvey sabu for president yeah he doesn't mean it literally, Sabu. Calm down. A little can, I bribe, can I bribe him with peanuts? Uh, oh, shit. Just throw him and he'll chase him. All right. Then he's got my vote. There he is. He's, 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 he's easy. He's easy. Uh, thank you, Dilbertson. Great to see you, my friend. Uh, Sporking News Podcast with a $2 super chat. Hail to the Sporking News Podcast. Says, my favorite show on the net. Hail to the unknown. Wow. That is high praise indeed. Favorite show on the net. Yeah. Thank you. Man, what about the Inquisition? What is that? Chopped liver? Thank yeah, you, Sporking, Sporking News. News. <laughs> Mahabiz, my legionnaire minister of undead affairs with a $20 super chat. Hail Mahabiz, who says, sorry for not darkening your door lately, overlord. I will watch this in its entirety when I return from my wonderful new job. Even Tim Poole is breaking the big UFO news. Shine that light where it needs shining, good sirs. Uh, I think we may have made news here. I think if that, I think we might have leak. Shit. Quite frankly, um, there there are some great paranormal uh, voices out there right now, uh, but I think uh, I think there's a place for us. I, I do. Oh um, I, I I'm into this stuff. So whether there is or not, I'm I'm gonna. We are gonna take a place. <laughs> We're so, taking our place at the table. By yeah. God, uh, we we pulled up a, two chairs to that table today, my friend. And uh, I got to say, it was a, a great honor and a and a comfort to do this with you. You are uh, you are a shining light uh, on the internet, and uh, you know on YouTube, you're just. Uh, couldn't couldn't ask for a a better partner on this. Thank you, Gary. Right back at you, man. Seriously, uh, I you make uh, the internet a better place and a smarter place for sure. I uh, thank you, sir. Uh, the feeling is absolutely mutual. And Clan Razor has a dollar ninety nine super sticker for you, man. It's got to be for you. It's a it's a finger up there with like a number one, and uh, and you you rock. So, Usually uh, I have the other finger raised up at me, so I'm appreciating <laughs> that. And I'm sure it's for you too. We all do. Yes, we well, we we both get that. We both get that. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mahaviz. You are awesome, my friend. Absolutely awesome. Uh, and Mexican Iron Man says Re Apex uh, Tyrannus above. He is 100 on point. Uh, let's see where uh, he says. Uh, the level of interactiveness in this show with guests makes it way better than TV and radio. You can actually get questions in and get responses. This is the future. Absolutely. Yes. Tyrannus. I think maybe next time we may just want to have one guest 
uh, might might even make us a little more interactive. But these two together were just fantastic. They uh, really I mean, friends. Yeah, that worked. It, it really did. They 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 really like each other. And and hell, we they didn't even realize how close they were. I think we brought those two kids together, man. We did. We did. <laughs> and and it it really gives you a good for anybody. Uh, and I love oh, when they brought this up. When anybody said that they do this for the money. Uh, no, uh, nobody, nobody gets, okay. Maybe a couple of people have gotten rich in ufology, but, uh, ufology usually screws it up. Robert Bigelow offered a million dollars for ufology to come together and, and they couldn't do it. They, they fucked it up. Uh, so like it, it's purely passion. Uh, if you go and listen to some of, um, uh, of Peter's lectures on YouTube. He talks about how a couple of researchers, uh, I mean, lost, they got so into the subject that they lost their family. I mean, they, they just detached yeah. from their families. It's, it's, it's kind of a dangerous, uh, uh, a rabbit hole you go down, but it's necessary. This, I mean, I'm, this is not hyperbole. This is the, this is the biggest story in the world. This is mm -hmm. the, this is a story of, uh, of meaning of, of our place in existence. And, uh, and, and no matter what's out there and yeah, we're, we're tiny. We're tiny. My favorite thing in hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy is the torture device that shows you how small you are in the universe. <laughs> uh, and, and that Zaphod Beeble rocks goes in there and survives it. Cause he knows he's the biggest thing, but uh, the total, <laughs> it's called the total perspective vortex. And it shows you compared to the universe and you just die from it. But the thing is, we it, we are important and and we're it's crazy and just uh, just seeking knowledge it's uh, i don't know am i dorky I'm, I'm a nerd so i i find that's fun uh what, it, it what, is fun man when when uh when when i get when i get older with mrs nerd Roddick, we're gonna trot around the planet and go to those places he was talking about i mean you know we're gonna save up our ducats and 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 go uh because i need to see that stuff i saw ruins pretty much for the first time in my life uh, the last year, uh, when I went to, to Sicily and it, uh, I stared, <laughs> I stared at, at ruins for four hours, four hours, just wow. staring at it. Like I couldn't believe it. It was so mind boggling to me and cool. And, uh, yeah, not, not a word to anybody, just me walking in a circle around some, I can't even, I don't even know what it was. Giant columns, uh, in Sicily for four hours. And I loved it. So I, I, I feel you, man, it, it, to be in those places, feel the vibe. And, yeah. uh, that's particularly your, you know, your, uh, your thing. And, and, uh, I'm really glad you got a chance to go over there and look at that stuff. Yeah. Oh my God. M Mrs. Nerdotic had to drag me too. Cause I, I hate flying. Yeah. So I was like, I don't yeah. know. I was trying to look for excuses not to go. And I think I'm <laughs> sick and I got to do a show. And <laughs> I hear you. I hear you, man. Uh, Rural with a two dollar super chat says, Hail Doomcock, Harvey, and Sabu. Thank you, Rural. Very much appreciated. To which I would add, Hail Nerdrotic. Uh, thank you, Rural, very much for that super chat, brother. I hope you had fun today. Uh, Clinton Kill Depstein with a twenty dollar Australian mm. super chat. Clinton Kill Depstein uh, says, <laughs> I have seen both Sorry. ghosts and ufos wow i've, I've never a seen a experience. ghost and uh i'm probably glad i haven't i mean that kind of thing probably would you know spook me out creep me out uh but i have seen a ufo uh you you've experienced some kind of ghost stuff haven't you or a ghost i, I have or something? yes i heard i i uh it was a sound uh well no it was there um it was th this okay real quick i'll try to be as fast as possible on this one <laughs> I was doing the Rocky Horror Picture Show at the La Paloma Theater in Encinitas, California in 1987. There is a dressing room under the stage. I was there with a couple girls. We were chilling, doing what, you know, teenagers do. And uh, somebody, it's, it sounded like somebody walked on the stage above us. Well, I locked the place up. I had the keys. I, I showed everyone out. And, it, and, we went, go up and checked. We checked everywhere. There was nobody there. Went back down to the dressing room. Somebody walked across the damn stage again. We went up and checked, went down again. Somebody walked across the goddamn stage again. And the reason I know it wasn't one of my friends, because my friends would never F with me without taking credit for it. They would love to just come out and go, <laughs> I got you, dude. 
and I checked and there is a bunch of nooks and crannies in this very old theater with old passages in it. Know everyone went and everyone. Um, and, uh, uh, then there was, uh, when we walked up, I popped down the door, the, the, the door to the stairway. And so like, if I heard it again, I could pop my head up really quick to see if somebody was there. And I did that and there was nobody there and we got the hell out of there. I, I, I grabbed, uh, you can't do this nowadays if Ray, Ray, uh, Ray Palpatine would have hated it, but I grabbed the girl's hand and we went to the taco shop across the street and stayed there until the sun came up. Uh, wow. Yep. So that was, uh, I, I was on a, I was stoned a little, little weed, but weed doesn't make you hallucinate. Well, I don't know. Maybe the stuff nowadays does, but the crap we had back in the eighties <laughs> didn't. So the yeah. skag, the, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, yeah, you know, that's a pretty, that's a pretty fascinating story, man. That's spooky. Uh, and, uh, I, I think they exist. I'm just glad I haven't actually seen any. Yeah. Uh, two, three, four. Pika Pika says, I've seen several ghosts, but I worked in old castles and cloisters. They are like pests or pets there. So if you go to the right location, uh, you can see that stuff. Yeah. It's, uh, it's pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, Zabe with a $2 super chat. Thank you, Zabe. Says, thanks for the exozone. The truth is out there. Actually, tonight, I think the truth was in here. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, thank you, Zabe. Uh, that, that's a fantastic support, my friend. And by the way, I uh, I love that game, Deus Ex. I liked the sniper stuff. I love being a sniper in games. I have the temperament of a sniper. Uh, Nebraska Because with a $3.99 super chat. Thank you, Nebraska Because. Says, love this. Please do more high strangeness streams. Absolutely, Nebraska, because uh, we're, we're going to stick with it as long as YouTube will let us, you know, as long as YouTube will let us. That's uh, that's the key, really. That's the key. Uh, Mick Lolly with a two euro super chat. Hail Mick it says, hail Doomcock. Can you show your guests your UFO shot? I Man, you know, I would have to I would have to look for it. And uh, I just. I, I saw your 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 super chat there, Mick, and uh, I I just you know I was busy uh, trying to to wrangle everything and keep things moving and and paying attention, and I just didn't have time to look on my uh, my hard drive for it. But I do have it, and uh, I'll show it to you guys next time. Okay, I'll talk about the uh, the story, and and uh, I yeah. will show it to you guys next time. I mean, I showed it before. Yeah, and all I got was a whole lot of. A crap for it but uh gary was yeah. that not a hell of a shot it was a hell of a shot it was weird and that's what makes me believe it because it was weird uh i i don't think there i yeah i think i think the strange if you, a lot of the weird ufo shots i believe were the where it's not a uh, it's not i don't know it's not a typical structure it it's I, I think we try to ground stuff too much in our reality, or at least I do. I'll speak for myself. Uh, I, I don't, I think if alien things would look alien, like absolutely, like it wouldn't be symmetrical. Like why would it need to be? Maybe they have a whole different set of physics or what, or they understand it better than we do, which what they most likely do, uh, considering they can travel real quick. We have a star in the chat. Uh, drunk three PO is here. So what's up drunk three PO just wanted to say hi to you. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just, I thought, uh, no, especially with the, the, the two pictures you had together, I thought that was the most convincing. Cause it was like a, a I don't know. It was like a cloud or something like a, uh, not mist. It was weird. Almost yeah. like digital distortion. However, you know, I wouldn't fake it. I mean, no, you know, why would, I mean, who in the hell, uh, yeah, no. I mean, I've said my whole life, I've waited to see something and, and it was just very odd that the whole circumstances, the fact that I was, uh, you know, kind of doped up on Valium and, uh, you know, and I, I just boom, just over there. I'm like, holy shit. And the only reason I could take a picture was I was being driven, right? I wasn't driving. Yep. Yeah. And, no, uh, I, I mean, you and, can see through the the car, you know, the, the windshield and, and everything, you know, the dashboard and, and, and I, uh, I like so, your theory of, uh, if you're in a different state of consciousness, it, it probably decloaks things, you know, maybe the cloaking is based on a certain consciousness wave that <clears throat> when you're on something, you're on a different frequency 
and you see stuff that people, but the camera saw it for one frame and didn't see another. I thought that was strange. It is a weird cool. thing. And that's why I wanted to bring it up. And I was going to send it to, uh, you know, Tyler on secure team, but I don't know what's going on with Tyler. He's got some, something's going on, man. And, uh, poor guy. Yeah. I love um, secure team. I mean, I, I know that they were kind of poo pooing it, but, uh, shit. I mean, he, all he does is present the stuff that he sent. I, you know, I, I certainly never believe that he fakes anything. I certainly don't. Uh, I like the guy. I do too. I, he's going through some hard times right now though. So I hope he, whatever it is, it's, he gets better. Uh, Motolicious says snow flame with a $2 super chat. <laughs> snow flame. That's right. I got a little snow flame on my mic. I don't know if anybody ever notices that, but, uh, probably not right here. A little, uh, mini mate snow flame. Uh, that was, there he is. There you go. There he is. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, super chat Motolicious. Um, thank you, Mexican Iron Man, again for those wonderful super chats. And RR, bless you, my friend. Apex Tyrannus, fantastic. Mary Ashmead, I'm sorry I didn't get to your uh, the the angel that gave uh Joseph Smith the the tablets. Oh, yeah, tablets, and then of course, they mysteriously uh, he couldn't produce them later. I, I no, kind of uh, Mike Allred did a comic book on that though. Did he? The golden tablets. Yes, he did. <laughs> a serious comic on it. He's uh, good. I like him. Yeah. Oh, he's great. He's great. Uh, yeah. It's uh, the, the American West. Their weird stuff happens here. It's, it's a bizarre place, especially the Southwest and the desert and stuff. It's just that the, the people are, there's a vibe that I cannot explain, especially if you go to the deserts of California. Woo. Uh, there's some uh, like Yerba and Yuma and, uh, Oh, Salton sea. Some weird, weird people. Yes. S says this weird person. Well, well we're, we're yeah, all weird, I'm weird over here. Uh, the white wolf with a five pound super chat hail to the white wolf. He says, I believe aliens exist, but not on earth yet. The galaxy is huge and limited by the speed of light. The odds of them finding us are near infinite. Uh, well, we're, we're broadcasting out there and stuff and, uh, you know, I don't think it's that unlikely, but, uh, I, I don't know. Something I mean, has found us. Something well, has found us. Yeah, for sure. I, I, there's too many sightings out there and just what Christopher was talking, we're talking about one to two to 3% of them are absolutely unexplainable by every, even skeptics there's a percentage that they cannot explain. And of that percentage, it's some of it's gotta be real. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it, it, and we're talking thousands of years. We've been talking about this. This isn't just a, a, a thing that's popped up now. It's blown up since 47 coincidentally when we, uh, you know, with the atomic bomb, which I think is kind of a first contact. Uh, it, that's the way I theorized it. New, uh, we, explode our first atomic bomb and that is the where we're on their radar they're not going to contact us but we're on their radar and they're going to come and check us out because we've just made a leap and uh we'll see from there maybe cern is the next one or who knows we might be in a black hole right now or the last one i was gonna say <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh man uh thank you to the white wolf uh for the super chat and for the gift of um uh, only fools and horses. Uh, I, I really appreciate that. And I will be in touch with you uh, about it uh, soon, my friend, as soon as I get a chance to pop it on and watch a few episodes. Well, okay. I, what is that real quick? I've heard, is that a it's, show? A, it's a British comedy. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cause I, Oh, you know what? I just saw it in an ad from big chief. They have some toys from, uh, cause I, no I, used to, yeah, only that's what, that's what here. I'll turn on my camera. Doomcock. Uh, I got my eighth doctor from uh, big finish, which is awesome. And there you go. Only, only f that's where I saw it. I'll be doggone. Look at that. Yep. That's them right above dad's army, which I've heard of. Okay. I've that, heard of that one. Oh, see, I used to, I've, I, I don't know where the, I think it was PBS where I've seen dad's army before. It's got John LeMessure right there. And, uh, yeah. And of course, uh, oh, I missed it. Oh, space 1999. What, Dude, the hell? The, what, what is the, look at, look at, 
Oh, this is wow. here. Uh, this is Big Chief Studios. Look it up, folks. They do a uh, one six scale Doctor Who is unfortunate. Oh, you want to see here real quick? Jody's been available for two years and she's not uh -huh. sold out yet, but the third doctor's already sold out. There's there you go. Right there. there you go. Now we're talking right there. Real doctor. Real doctor. Ah. Crap. <laughs> I mean, they had to introduce the oh man that's, that's, that's damn good that's pretty awesome right I'd rather, like a barbara bain one but then i would of course do do bad things to it so <laughs> not not mean not mean just uh just bad but uh yeah she, god she was hot something about that ice princess thing that she had going it was mm -hmm. just, uh, i don't know man i'm betraying too much i better shut up uh let's uh <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jesus, what was I? Oh, speaking of cute girls, uh, some nobody with a two dollar super chat. Thank you, some nobody says Navajo girls have a super cool accent, too. Very cute. I'm talking about you know the skinwalkers and skinwalker ranch and everything. How about that, man? How about that? He was he knows the guy, he he knows the guy and the two law enforcement, the, the Navajo Rangers. Which, uh, again, that's not just a willy nilly position, uh, that they just hand out to anybody, um, who saw the dog smoking. Um, oh, that god, and they personally attest to how. Uh, credible and honest those guys are man that could could that have been better i mean that to no. me that was like the highlight because we had marveled in a previous exozone about the damn smoking uh dogs in trench coats for fuck's sake yeah whoa <laughs> that was just too no it, it 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 makes you think <laughs> i mean the kind of things okay the kind of things you think about when you're on hallucinogenics are is stuff like that is like is the dream world just real and something we access when we sleep or i mean just it's you know uh and it and it's something you uh, i'll speak for myself it's something i wouldn't take seriously until i opened my mind to that it opened a whole new door of consciousness and thought and open mindedness and uh all possible it's like you're you walk behind a veil, right? And you're observing the world from a completely different perspective. And uh, yep. it's hard to explain. It's hard uh, to explain. I, yeah, no, I, I hear what you're saying, man. And I, I agree with you 100%. Uh, Stephen Stafford with a $5 super chat. Thank you, Stephen. Says, what an amazing show. My wife came home from work and let me keep it on. Oh. LOL. Well, good for her. I'm glad she didn't beat you about the head and shoulders with a stick. She's obviously uh, a very listening to the Echo Zone. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen Stafford. That is so awesome. Uh, John, uh, no, I already got that one. Cobra Strike Down with a $10 super chat. Thank you, Cobra Strike Down. Says, makes me so happy. Two of my favorite YouTubers are into this topic. I've had three experiences in my first, much like one of your guests. I didn't remember until later. Really wish I could tell in my experiences. I uh, have many questions. Oh, I'm so sorry, Cobra Strike Down. I would have definitely, if you had just uh, popped a question in there, I would have asked it for you. Uh, but next time, man, next time. God bless you, Cobra Strike Down. I appreciate very much uh, your kind support and that super chat. All of you guys, uh, I had to kind of move quick and, and everything. Thank you for your patience and in all of your support and, and, you know, normal live streams will resume, but this was uh, kind of a special case. So uh, it was just kind of unique. Uh, some nobody with a $2 super chat. Thank you. My friend says uh, don't need uh, any kind of mushrooms. I know I would see my dead sweetheart. Oh mm, yeah. 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 There's, yeah, there's uh, yeah. There's, um, definitely be of sound mind and body and be with people you absolutely trust or don't or don't. And, and if you have any kind of uh, depression issues or anything, I would say, no, don't, don't do it. Wow. Yeah. Uh, good, good advice from somebody who, who knows yeah. uh, armchair warlord with a $2 super chat. Thank you. Armchair warlord says hail the XO zone. Good to see this show again. I agree. I've missed it. I've absolutely missed it. Uh, thank you. Armchair warlord for being here, brother. Um, and yes, I will upload this ASAP on the Harvey zone, 
uh, so that people can uh, get back onto it. And then I'm also going to cut it uh, to be like maybe about an hour and in 10 hour and 15 minutes, uh, and have a tight edit of it. So we can tag it and have people who are hardcore, uh, find it and maybe discover the exo zone through that, Gary. I think that's kind of the way we ought to proceed on this stuff. It, it can be one of those videos where somebody else, uh, cause I find those videos at night and I go to sleep to them. You know, I, I, I that's what I did with, uh, Robbins last night. I listened to part of his, I just fired it up. Maybe our video will be that for somebody else. I that's hope so. Weird. That's, that's a great, great point, brother. Um, guard goldsmith with a $10 super chat. Thank you. Guard says, this is terrific. Peter all, if you're back in New Hampshire sometime, I'll get you dinner promise no mutilated cow parts i'm sorry i couldn't get to that question i didn't see it guard uh they were kind of antsy to they needed to leave after three hours i mean yeah uh, they were they they were champs they hung it wasn't there. perfect i apologize guard goldsmith uh i will get them next time and in fact uh when i write to thank them i will say uh guard goldsmith uh said that okay i'll send them your message thank you my friend uh, Lori Roberts also, uh, with a $5 super chat asked, have you guys ever studied the Philadelphia experiment and or Montauk project? Okay, Lori, I apologize again, uh, for that. They kind of, you know, like I said, uh, I ran out of time, but I promise you that next time that we have either of those guys on, uh, we will ask that question for you, Lori. Sorry, Lori Roberts, uh, I appreciate you and, uh, we'll, we'll make it happen. Thank you, Lori Roberts. Uh, Michelle P with a dollar ninety nine super chat. Thank you, Michelle. Says happy Exo Zone is back. Yes, Michelle, I know you've been waiting for it, and uh, I'm glad that we were able to oblige you on this. It was a blast. Some nobody again with a two dollar super chat. Thank you. Some nobody says government. Uh, no, excuse me. Uh, yeah, government scans email and texts. Disclosure is for surveillance. Ah, that's interesting. So what? They're kind of baiting out people that believe this stuff or something? Maybe. Huh. That's pretty grizzled there, some nobody. That's pretty grizzled. Uh, hail some nobody and thank you. Uh, viewing screen says, I heard a coronavirus is going around. Yeah, I've heard that too. But I don't think you get it by drinking corona. That, yeah. that, is, a, that is a false rumor. That is a false rumor. Uh, thank you, some nobody. Apex Tyrannus with a $10 super chat. Thank you, Apex Tyrannus. Says Doomcock, please have Dr. McCulloch on soon so he can dive into the only physics we have that can even begin to explain UFOs. DARPA has given him over $1 million to test his hypothesis. Yes, Apex Tyrannus. Uh, we need to get in touch with uh, Dr. McCulloch and, and get him on the show. He can talk about uh, the physics of this stuff. And I think it could be uh, a pretty amazing show, Gary. Uh, yeah, we'll make that we'll make that happen. Uh, thank you, Apex Tyrannus. Some nobody with a two dollar super chat and a great comment here. Thank you again, my friend. Says JJ can't even direct whores. Don't buy it. <laughs> so he's not a, a horror director. He's not a horror director. He's just a miss director. Can we agree on that? JJ Abrams is a miss director. Uh, thank you, some nobody. Appreciate you, brother. Nicholas Horton with a five pound super chat. Thank you, Nicholas, says DC and Gary. Best exozone ever. And is Miss Ner Nerdrotic uh, okay after spending time in Japan, especially with the yeah. coronavirus stuff going on? Yeah, we were a little uh, worried about that, but yeah, we, uh, it, she's, she's fine. She, her health is fine. So, no, no problems at all. Good. None so far. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, yeah, we can't wait to get her back. Need to need to come rescue you. You're, you're definitely uh, having a, having a handful. Yeah, being alone there. Oh God, yeah, I'm, I'm the freaking lost mule in the desert. I'll be honest with you. Well, <laughs> she'll be back. She'll be back. Yeah. No. I, well. No. It's all good now. Get that. We're, we're uh, we we're now we have to get uh, Junior in his school and mom taking care of all kinds of stuff needs us. So it's probably good that January's slow towards the end. Uh, mm -hmm. but it all takes right. next month. You're not you're not missing out on much. Oh boy. Yeah. Really I could I could seriously skip the next episode of Doctor Who. I, I'd be fine with that. Oh man, that was ridiculous. They had to actually go to the lengths of introducing another doctor uh that was that was bad enough to actually make Jody. Uh, look, look better. 
Uh, I think that was their strategy. <laughs> I, I, and I can't call Jody the first female doctor played by Jody Whitaker anymore. Not in the timeline anyway. I know. She's not the first female doctor anymore. They screwed that up for her, which kind of makes me laugh, although it's deeply offensive and makes me disgusted and angry. It is. Um, but like people, uh, it got a little bump in the ratings, but people are dipped out on this now. They, they like people, are, it, it reached the point of no return, just like uh, where Star Wars is it. People threw their hands up in the air and just went frack, frack it and walk. They're walking away now. Yeah. Uh, well, that that's good. That's good because oh, he needs to get away from this crap. Yep. Uh, RR with a $9.99 super chat. Thank you, RR. Says, if you have to make the people wait for the return of a hit show, DVD, you and Gary just rewrote the book on how to do it. Phenomenal job. A mega blockbuster of an exozone. And Gary, take care of Mom Roddick. I will. You're doing a great job, buddy. Doing a great job. Thanks, man. I'm sorry it's tough. Uh, drunk 3PO, hail drunk 3PO with a 499 super chat. Appreciate it, sir. Says, love you guys, fandom menace. Hail to the fandom menace and hail to drunk 3PO. Hail. And thank you, brother, for that support. Good hail. to see you, man. Uh, Motolicious with a two dollar super chat. Thank you. Oh, Motolicious one says, government project called Devil's Messiah uses Blue Beam. Ah, so the uh, aforementioned thing where, where siblings were. Uh, witnessing uh, visions in blue light from Lady Mist earlier. So you think that that might actually be um, uh, this this project uh, hmm. uh, Devil's Messiah. Interesting. I hear that they're going to fake all sorts of things, like a UFO or a return of Jesus in the sky with hologram technology. Project so. Blue Beam. Yep. Something to look forward to. Hail Motolicious, thank you, my friend. And Ulrich Kohl with a hundred Danish krona, DKK. Isn't that Danish krona? I believe so. Yes, uh, that's what I call you it. Very much, Ulrich. Uh, it says, did neither of you notice Picard saying, Oh, yes, I did. I never much cared for science fiction. Yeah, I, I just didn't get it. Well, maybe you just didn't find it as ironic as I did. Love your channels. No, man, I just, I just. You know, I, I got that damn review out uh, this morning, which, you know, a lot of people haven't even looked at because nobody gives a damn about Picard anymore. But yeah, I mean, there was a lot of stuff I couldn't even squeeze in there because I was just, man, I had to get it out and then I had to get ready for this. And I, it's just been a hell of a busy day, guys. Yeah. And and the worst thing about it is that's that's a Sir Patrick Stewart line. They actually, in his infamous variety interview, he says that. In the so like, um, and listen, when I hear a saying, I try to attribute it. it it's like my, uh, it's you got to attribute it to who you heard it from on YouTube because sometimes sayings get around and people take credit. So, uh, Mister, uh, he's the first person I heard it from anyway. So, Mister H reviews was on Midnight's Edge, and he coined uh, Picard a vanity project, and I could not agree more with that sentiment that this is a vanity project. Uh, towards the end of his life, uh, he got this is this is a way for the guy who supposedly didn't care about any of this stuff one upped William Shatner big time. He got his own solo show, uh, and uh, it's really showing through now. It really is. And I should have yeah, I should have probably put that in my review, but I didn't. You get it here. <laughs> yes, uh, it, I'm it, checking. It, it's available for uh, the first episodes on freaking CBS All Access. Uh, da, 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 da. yeah, it's got 306,000 views this morning. It was up for eight hours. By the way, this is after they advertised it. If they would have just left it on YouTube, like you and I, without any advertising after being on YouTube for eight hours, it only had 5,000 views. Really? It only had, I have screenshots, <laughs> but now they put out all their advertising and stuff and now it's got views on it. So there you go. Wow. Yeah. Well, uh, mine, my, uh, my, it's, it's not, it's not doing hardly anything. I, uh, I think no. it's, I think people are don't, don't, I think people are thoroughly done with doctor who. And I think, I mean, the episode was just boring. I, I, yeah, I think it, it's going to play hard to the base maybe. Uh, and that's it. Yeah. 
Well, actually, I don't know who it's going to appeal to, but uh, uh, to be honest with you, I don't, I don't either, but uh, I don't have any idea. Um, uh, Apex Tyrannus has another super chat here for us. Gary he says, uh, with a $10 super chat, thank you, my friend. If anyone has Indian magic or psychic abilities, they would walk into every casino and effing empty the place. They would dominate the stock market. Uh, this is strong evidence against such abilities. Um, well, I mean, it depends on how skilled they were. I mean, it depends on if you could just turn it on or turn it off, or if it's kind of a, you know, irregular thing that is, uh, beyond control. Well, if you have the ability to count cards, which many people do, as a matter of fact, uh, I have that ability with dominoes. Uh, really? if, I, if I sit there and I'll play a game with dominoes, uh, you know, about halfway through the game, I'm going to figure out what you have. It's pretty easy to do. Uh, I, I have a good memory with numbers. That's why I was a good parts guy. Uh, and, and, uh, cause I can remember number sequences. It's like one, my one stupid superpower. Uh, and yeah, I <laughs> can, I can, amazing. I can rattle off the brake part number for uh, a Honda right now, a 45022 SD4 AO2. Uh, that's an Integra. That's a 95 uh, Acura Integra uh, rear brake, brake pads. Um, and uh, so it, it's it's something you can, uh, it, the casino might be able to figure that out uh, unless you can use your Indian magic to, uh, to fight off the security that's going to pull you out of there when they start seeing you winning unusually. Uh, that <laughs> So I don't know. Um, I, I, listen, I don't know if I believe in, in magic, but I do believe in ancient Indian lore. That is an oral tradition that's been passed down for thousands of years that we know nothing about because they don't share it. So like the Hopi, for instance, they go back, they go way back and they have some, they have the, the whole ant people stories and stuff and there's stuff we don't know. And they have the, the pretty much the old the, the longest living oral tradition history in this country i believe so uh there's a lot of things we don't know uh because we were taught in schools the official version of events some of that stuff is bad basic math english yes go to school but you got to remember that there's curriculums now which are politically based and are also based in uh in throttling knowledge as much as getting it out there uh, keeping a narrative going. So I don't know. I'm not going to say definitively. I don't know. I am skeptical of that. I will say that, but, um, uh, there might, it, it might not be magic. There might be a way just, it's, uh, a, a very intelligent way of, uh, being, a, I don't know, being, uh, it's hard to explain it. I, like a, a good grifter, you know, uh, learning how to con in a certain way that they don't know or something slide a hand that kind of magic. Sure. Why not? Why not? Uh, thank you, Ifrit0990, for this good job super sticker. Giving me the thumbs up in that gi, that cute little sticker. Uh, thank you, my friend, Ifrit0990. And that brings us to the end of our show today. Uh, Gary, can you go ahead and uh, plug your channel, my friend? Certainly. Uh, I am on a channel called Nerdrotic. I cover the good, the bad, and the ugly of pop culture. I do a show called The Inquisition with Doomcock. We also do the Exozone. And uh, yeah, uh, please subscribe if you haven't already, if you like what you heard. If you didn't like, if you don't like it, I understand. Absolutely. And uh, please subscribe to Overlord DVD. That's youtube.com slash Overlord DVD. And also uh, youtube.com slash The Harvey Zone, especially that because that's where these live streams go uh, after they're done. So uh, go and check them out, my friends. And uh, thank you for being here uh, on this return to the Exo Zone. Uh, I had a blast, and I think you guys are uh, fantastic. And the White Wolf is saying, I think you'll like Only Fools and Horses. It's funny off the bat, but not wild hilarity like Young Ones and Bottom. It hits its stride after first season. I'm looking forward to it, the White Wolf. Thank you, my friend. I want to thank uh, Mary Ashmead. And Chris Persia, and of course, Bionic Belly Button, nee, 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 for all of your outstanding work today. Thank you for all of your help. Uh, we really needed it today, and you guys really delivered. Thank you so very, very much. 
And from the center of the earth, this is Dictor Van Doomcock bidding you all, my friends, stay angry. <laughs>